So hello everybody and welcome to the second Business and Human Rights Conference hosted by the IOE, the BDA, and um, physically hosted by Deutsche Post DHL Group. Um, my name is Nicole Chipa. Um, I'm the Vice President Employee Relations at Deutsche Post DHL Group, and it's my pleasure to guide you through this afternoon and through the conference, um, both physically and virtually um, held here. So we are looking forward to three and a half very interesting hours of um, presentations, discussions and panel conversations. And we have some very remarkable speakers with us to highlight some of um, some aspects of uh, human rights in the business context about challenges, recent developments and future trends. As you um, can see online, we have a hybrid format. So here in Trostdorf at the Innovation Center of Deutsche Post DHL Group. We have a group of about uh, 30 colleagues and, and participants joining us here. And we have about 250 online registrations. Um, you can follow us through Zoom. You can type your questions into the chat. And when we have some Q&A sessions, you can also raise your hand to ask questions. So without further ado, I would like to kick it off and announce our first keynote speaker here um, from Deutsche Post DHL Group, um, the board member of Human Resources since 2017 and the labor director. Um, Human Resources um, is also hosting the human rights topic in DPDHL and therefore it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Thomas Ogevi here on stage to give you the business perspective on human rights. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you here in the room, but also good afternoon to all visitors watching virtually. Um, it feels good to be back again together in a conference setting, but I think having the beauty of a hybrid format gives many more colleagues and people around the globe the opportunity to participate. So, Talking about human rights, I think it is a topic that is more important than ever. On the one hand side, you could argue, and me being born and raised in Germany, that human rights is something we do not debate much about because it is something that we take for granted. And looking into this room, I see some faces where I assume that also you, from your birth until today, just in your personal environment, human rights were and is something that you always took for granted. But if we take a look around, obviously in the world is a lot of tension, a lot of motion. Unfortunately, a severe war in Ukraine right now, which always reminds us that human rights are something that we cannot take for granted, but that we need to protect to defend and also to fight for constantly and continuously. And if you look back into history, into the evolution of human rights, there are some important dates like the Declaration of Independence in the United States, where already important elements of the human rights statement as we know it today were embedded into this Declaration of Independence as a consequence and of a reaction to the Civil War. You see also the elements in the Declaration of Human Rights in, after the French Revolution, and obviously in what we are talking about, where the United Nations came together in 1948 as a consequence and a reaction after the Second World War to say, we need to agree on some universal and fundamental principles because we are all human beings, which is something that connects us. And it is something that also gives an obligation to all of us to protect these rights of human beings. And I think there's a good reason that in the preface of the Declaration of Human Rights, it is clearly stated that justice and peace are the key targets and aspirations that are to be achieved by universal human rights. What does it mean for today, for the 21st century, and in particular also for 
the corporate environments we are operating in. So obviously we have a world where we have many countries where, as I said in the beginning, fortunately we can take it for granted. Nevertheless, that doesn't take away transparency, control and diligence obligations to protect what we have achieved already. Unfortunately, we nevertheless see many countries, and I think you all read about the deterioration of human rights during the pandemic in many countries, that fundamental human rights were reduced, limited, and taken away. And that's something we need to be aware of, because the previous pushes on human rights were public ones, were governmental ones after the Civil War, after the French Revolution with the United Nations in 1948. But what we see today is that at least on a global scale, there is no unanimous consent anymore among the countries how to drive human rights. But at the same time, there's something like a grassroots push, or you could also call it a de democratization of the implementation of human rights, that we as corporate companies, as multinationals, are the ones who think about what do we need to establish as standard, or what do we have to establish as also procedures, controls, and diligence mechanisms to have a proper adoption of human rights all around the globe. And I think this gives a lot of power to the business, but it is also a big obligation to the business because with what we are doing, we actually contribute also to raising the bar, not only in those countries where human rights are already well established, but also to raise the bar in countries where there's still a gap or a significant gap to perfection. And I think that makes it so important beyond all the direct commercial implications of it to have an understanding that our collaboration with the international employers, BDA, United Nations, and all social stakeholders, that we contribute not only to protect and defend human rights, but also to be a bit spearheading and lead or trailblazing with our standards into countries to raise the bar there. If I look at it from a perspective of our company, of Deutsche Post DHL Group, we have three reasons why we think it is important, talking about sustainability as a whole, on E, S, and G, but then in particular on the social pillar, to have a clear commitment, to have a clear aspiration, and to have a high level of transparency for the measures that we took on these topics. Of course, there's a simple reason, because it's just the right thing to do. But there is more beyond just doing good. One reason is that obviously there's rising stakeholder interest, and in particular a rising stakeholder interest also from the capital market side, that we, as multinationals, at stock-listed companies, actually mitigate, prevent, and eliminate risk for the future conduct of a company. The whole sustainability agenda in a company can be seen as a significant risk mitigation effort for the long-term success of a firm. And whatever we do, if it is decarbonization, if it is mitigation, and protection against cyber attacks on the governance side, or if it is in the social pillar, when we talk about diversity and inclusion in our company, where we talk about operational health and safety, where we talk about how to be a great company to work for all, all that comprises implicitly and explicitly the aspect of human rights. Because you only can be a great company to work for all if you are a fair employer, and fairness can be seen in various aspects, can be seen in the 
working conditions, can be seen in the remuneration, can be seen in the leadership approach, in the behavior of the company. And you can only be a great company to work for all when you are an employer who is contributing a surplus to the communities where we are operating in, instead of dragging out energy resources and just working with it or digesting it. So I think there is something where we talk about risk mitigation, but it is also a competitive edge when we talk about the employer branding, when we talk about attracting and retaining talent in scarce labor market and also many of the emerging countries we are talking about where we might have a higher focus on human rights due to the existing delta to perfection in these countries. In particular there, it is also a key differentiator in your employer value proposition to be a superior market player in the field of human rights. So you can even argue that there is a selfish interest of stock listed companies to lead the pack in these arenas. So that's a little bit of the motivation. But being together today here with this high profile lineup, I think there are also questions that are still unanswered. And I had the opportunity to have a brief conversation over lunch on this one. So what is actually the standard when we talk about good conduct? It's simple when you talk about the environmental sustainability because there is an absolute target. It's the net zero. And all a company has to do, as complicated as it is, is to define what's my path to zero, to decarbonize my footprint. Talking about the S pillar, it becomes more faceted. There is no currency yet. There is of course, our declaration of human rights, but it needs to have a proper translation into the operating model of the company. And it needs to have proper processes of assessment, of judgment and um, evaluation, and then obviously also how to initiate corrective actions. So I think talking about jointly, what's the currency, what are the levers, and perhaps also what are going forward the reporting and disclosure standards is something important. Secondly, and that's a topic which started already some years ago in Germany, but now evolved to a European scale and focus, where does the responsibility for human rights end from the perspective of an enterprise? Does it end with the boundaries of your own operations or is there also a responsibility beyond that? And what does it mean when we talk about supply chain due diligence, when we talk about how to also have a clear understanding and actually an influence on those who as third party providers um, provide services to us, which is something which will become effective. And I know you discussed this already also over lunch and in previous sessions, effective in law in Germany first of Jan next year. And there will be the step up on the European um, level over the upcoming years. And also to have a joint understanding what is good, how to manage responsibility across the supply chain is a topic which is extremely important. And in a way, we as a service company, as a logistic provider, adapting the logic of scope one, two, and three in environmental sustainability, we are a bit the scope three to some of the companies here when it comes to transportation of goods. And in turn, there is some companies who are the scope three for us. For example, those who manufacture our corporate wear. So at the end, it's a pretty much intertwined lineup. And I think it is important to have a stakeholder dialogue where we include all perspectives, where we talk about what is good, how can we implement it, and what is also our joint opportunity as we talk about how can we make it from challenges to opportunities to contribute to raising the bar on human rights globally so that justice, peace, and equality can be achieved across the globe. With that, 
I welcome you again and hand it back to Nicole. Thank you very much, Thomas. And we will see you again in a quarter of an hour when you will engage in a conversation with our next keynote speaker. To announce her, um, I would like to think about a birthday that happened in 2021. It was the 10 year birthday of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And um, we have the best suited speaker now to explain about these UNGPs, about their implementation journey, as well as about the current challenges now with us online. Um, to summarize the outstanding career of Michelle Bachelet is not an easy task because she has been engaging with international organizations since the early 1990s in many, many roles. And um, she was also um, twice the president of Chile as well as Chile's health minister and defense minister. And since September 2018, she holds her current role of being the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which means she is the highest authority on the UN for representing the human rights topic. So let's please give her a very warm welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Nicole. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, greetings from Geneva. And thank you for the invitation to address you today. I'm delighted to give this new keynote intervention at the IOE, BDA, BP, DP, DHL hybrid high level conference on business and human rights. As the UNGPs, I mean, the UN guidance principles turned 10, as you mentioned, Nicole, in June last year, the working group on, on business and human rights, which is supported by staff from the special procedures branch of my office, took stock of the first decade of implementation and presented its findings to the Human Rights Council in June 2021. The stock-taking report highlighted that the UN guiding principles for business human rights have led to significant progress by providing a common framework for all stakeholders in managing business-related human rights risk and impact. Yet, Considerable challenges remain when it comes to coherent action and implementation by states and businesses. In other words, a lot of work remains with respect to ensuring better protection and prevention of adverse human rights impact with particular attention of the most marginalized and discriminated against and to ensuring access to remedy for harms that occur. The working group's roadmap, which I warmly welcome when it was launched at the 2021 annual forum on, on business and human rights last November, outlined that what, what is needed for the next decade is to raise the ambition, as Dr. O'Gleary was mentioning, and increase the pace of implementation to improve coherence and create greater impact. Building on the stock taking reports analysis of achievement to date and existing challenges and opportunities, the roadmap details both the strategic direction and policy oriented steps needed to better implement the guidance principles in the coming years. The roadmap sets out key action areas for the road ahead and for progressively getting closer to a more complete realization of the UN guidance principles. Each action area identifies priority goals for what needs to happen and supporting actions to be taken by states and businesses, as well as other key stakeholders, all playing a role in realizing the implementation of the UN guiding principles. At the strategic level, the roadmap calls for a stronger embedding of the UNGPs in states and business efforts to address global challenges to put business respect for human rights at the heart of strategies to realize sustainable development and a just transition to a green economy that respects human rights. The roadmap also calls for more coherent action across the three pillars of the UNGPs by governments to realize the duty, the state duty to protect human rights, including by ceasing the current momentum uh, of mandatory human rights due diligence legislation by business where we need to see much greater uptake and translation of worthy commitments into practice and efforts by states to strengthen access to justice and state-based remedy and by businesses and others in enabling access to remedy through non-state-based mechanisms. It also underlines the need for action by key actors that shape business practice, notably the financial sector, 
but also others from lawyers to other business advisory service providers, business organizations, and academia. Moreover, the, mod the roadmap identifies a number of cross-cutting action areas and priority goals, such as meaningful stakeholder engagement that should be at the heart of any state's legal and policy measures to foster responsible business and, business and businesses' human rights due diligence and grievance management. Such engagement is a central cross-cutting aspect of the UNDPs and should be a core component of sustainable development and just transition approaches. The roadmap calls on the need for both more systemic tra tracking of state performance and for better corporate human rights performance data, including better disclosure, alignment, and consistency with human rights standards across benchmarks, scaling the availability of data, and focusing on actual performance and outcomes for people. To design the right responses, we need to know what works and what does not. Finally, the roadmap calls for implementation support, not least a more strategic and coordinated approach to address massive capacity building and awareness raising needs of all stakeholders across regions. The roadmap's clear policy-oriented goals and actions, if adopted by state, businesses, the UN, and others, can increase the pace and scale of the changes we need to see. I endorse its recommendations, including enhancing state learning and peer review. Considerable challenges remain with respect to ensuring better protection of human rights and prevention of adverse impacts on people resulting from business activity. The role of business in relation to our major global challenges requires close scrutiny. The triple threat of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss constitutes the greatest challenge to human rights in the, our era. Responsible practices that respect people and our planet need to be at the core of everything business does now and for future generations. Growing inequalities, reinforced by the COVID-19 crisis, and shrinking civic freedoms undercut our resilience and ability to effectively avoid disaster for our planet. Good intentions will not protect human rights or the environment we need, this, but because what we need is decisive leadership and transformative action by states and businesses. The next decade has the potential to be a period of significant transformative change for people and planet if states and businesses play their part. To this end, I refer you to the roadmap and the concrete steps outlined therein that all stakeholders should follow. In the face of today's multiple global crises, climate change, conflict and wars, rising inequalities and vulnerability, growing disinformation, we see human rights under dire threat and actually deteriorating in many places. Maybe I would say in too many places. In this context, we all need to stand up speak up to counter this negative evolution. The baseline responsibility for, for all businesses is to respect human rights in their own operations and business relationships. When it comes to human rights protection and fulfillment, business can be and should be a force for good through their own operations. To transform business activities into a force for good, this needs to be based on a strong commitment to human rights, grounded on solid human risk management system and systematic human rights due diligence guided by the UNGPs. And this is how business can contribute to address the pressing global challenges that we're all facing today. So finally, I want to say that to make human rights prevail, we need to all follow the same road guided by the same roadmap. We need allies acting as human rights advocate. We need partnership and collaboration among societal actors to build the future we want, one that is prosperous, just, inclusive, and sustainable. And in this journey, again, business has an essential role. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us. And thanks for your input and your key um, for your keynote. I think the fact that you take the time um, to join us today is a statement in itself. Um, and it's a big sign of appreciation um, that the High Commissioner on Human Rights actually uh, contributes to this conference. So I fully agree with you that um, this decade is a crucial one in many senses. And of course, there is the topic of um, how do we manage the 
energy transition and um, our decarbonization path um, to fight climate change. But I think looking, and you mentioned it before, that we have faced um, a deterioration in too many countries on human rights. I think it's also a crossroad decade on into which direction do we want to go as mankind? Will there be more and more countries being on the track to good or to bad conduct? And that's something, of course, where the United Nations and governments play an important role in creating, let's call it the governmental framework across countries. But obviously also um, companies and the private sector can play a role in this. And I said it in my intro, it is perhaps something like a grassroots movement that could in a way trailblaze also into places where human rights are, at question, uh, human rights are in question. So what would, you, what would be your very specific wish or ask to us in the private sector what we can do to support your ambition and um, to be support the UNGPs. Well, um, let, thank you, Thomas, for your question. And let me start saying that, uh, first of all, the working group stated that has been significant progress uh, over the first decade since the endorsement of the UNGPs and more companies in all regions of the world are establishing human rights due diligence policies. Yet, actual implementation I mean, one thing is endorsement and the other one is implementation. And few are really embedding human rights due diligence in their operation. That's the first thing I want to mention. So we need to make, make sure that human rights due diligence is a mainstream activity huh? and not as a sporadic effort of a few. I think we have great practices, but they're really too, too few and too sporadic. So the good news, however, and in those places that you see their good practices is that human rights due diligence is possible. Huh? It's possible and it's positive for the business as you were mentioning in your introductory remarks. Uh, the fundamental challenge going forward is to speed up and scale up efforts, build on the good practices that exist, but also to address remaining gaps huh? and, and challenges. So if, as I said before, effective due diligence can be done. There are a lot of practical examples, multiple tools and resources for business, and therefore business enterprises can no longer cite a lack of knowledge as an excuse for not upholding the responsibility to respect human rights. To this end, business uh, enterprises need to make human rights risk management if I may say, as a medical doctor, part of their DNA, if I may say, no? uh, by integrating human rights due diligence into core processes and letting it guide their decisions. They should train their staff about UNGPs and the development since 2011, using the many sources of information that exist online. For example, resources producing, produced by the working group and by our office, OTHR, and also by notable NGOs who have been working for a long time on this. There were sessions as well on the Forum on, on Business and Human Rights last year, which uh, provided, I would say, um, a lot of uh, space for multi-stakeholder dialogue on the implementation. And, and these sessions highlighted the step that business and the wider private sector can take to implement the, 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 the UN guidance principle, for example, enhance how they can enhance transparency and continued human rights due diligence uh, along supply chains. You were mentioning that, and I think this is one of the big challenges. I mean, I think there's two big challenges, supply chain, but also SMEs. SMEs because sometimes big companies have much more capacity to, 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 to be able to really follow all of the UN guidance principles, but sometimes for some, even big one in some very complicated environment is pretty difficult. So developing awareness throughout the business enterprise and across business relationship as well. So these sessions, there was an interesting discussion last year on that. So these sessions are available online for stakeholders to review and learn from what, when, when, what, what, what can be the challenges taking step forward to further implement it. So one other thing that I believe, and you mentioned it in some way as well, that business can and must do is to protect civic space and to see and, and treat communities and human rights defenders as, as partners. Many times business as government see uh, NGOs, human rights defenders as a threat. And I think it shouldn't be thought as a, trade, as a threat because it could help companies identify and address risk to people and the environment in their supply chains. So uh, I think that the working group presented guidance as well on this, on ensuring respect for human rights defenders. And this also provides practical steps that business should take. 
Uh, the other issue that I wanted to mention that I think is, is key is leadership from the top of a business enterprise. Uh, it, board members need to implement change and lead from the front, setting expectations for corporate conduct across companies' operations and ensure accountability mechanism. And the other place that we, I think we need to do more is the financial sector at large, at large including DFIs, banks, and investors to need to push for change and set, of course, expectations for responsible business conduct by the companies that they invest in. In 2021, the working group produced a report, as a matter of fact, on the extent to which investors have implemented the UNDPs and, and also made recommendations for increased investor action the next naked. And finally, on, on your question, business has a play to, uh, they can play a role in supporting legislative developments to implement the UN guided principles and responsible business conduct, including mandatory human rights due diligence uh, requirements. I think businesses can usefully engage with states to add and underline that clear guidance and regulations are helpful and indeed necessary to create legal certainty, a more level playing field, in, because some can, companies that I've spoken to, they say, well, if we follow all of this, afterwards, my competence is not following and I'm losing a lot of possibilities. So we, you need, that can be work to find a way that levels the playing field um, and also can increase leverage within value chains and better integrate the risk management. And all of this clearly is not only benefiting the people, but particularly as well, the, the, the businesses. So that's some topics sound super familiar to me um, and, and also resonate with me because when I just pick up what you said around how we as the private sector need to establish a tone from the top and also ensure that we have a proper involvement of all decision makers in the company, that sounds a little bit like the path um, that we pursued over the last uh, two to three years with our issuing of um, our human rights um, policy statement with um, the signatures of the whole corporate board and then also making human rights trainings mandatory for all of our executives across the globe plus and we will discuss this in one of our panels um, how then the implementation process on risk identification and uh, risk mitigation takes place so that's super familiar and um, I think as you said it is something where you need to establish this topic like you establish a business topic, like we also all learned, uh, let's say, to manage operational health and safety or how to manage trade law, as this is something which has the same level of importance and also um, the same level of formality. But you also picked on some aspects um, around like the big challenges, as you put it, talking about on the one hand side, the SMEs, and talking on the other hand about um, the uh, due diligence or the um, human rights across the um, supply chain. So on the SME side, obviously we are a big company at Deutsche Post DHL Group. What we can see nevertheless operating in um, all the countries of the world, um, and in particular in Africa, we see wherever we help companies to step into global trade, which leads to growth, which leads to more maturity on their processes. This also elevates human rights or thinking about corporate governance and good standards. And in that sense, I think also multinationals can be a little bit of a midwife in emerging countries for smaller companies to catch up to this level. And the other one was uh, on what you quoted, um, the, the human rights across the value chain. and. Um, we all know, and I mentioned it as well, there will be the human rights due diligence law or supply chain due diligence law in Germany. Um, yes. There will be an equivalent on a European scale, but it is important to have a level playing field, as you put it. And perhaps you can share a little bit um, um, about your thoughts on this human rights across the value chain and how can we truly establish a global level playing field to get there? Well, I don't have the solution, to be honest, Thomas, huh? but I've thought a lot and we have been working with this with the OECD, in particular in the mining sector, 
Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, mining companies understand that there is a reputational risk if they don't follow the UN guidance principles, and particularly and when they depend on, on, on a supply chain that they not, that cannot always control, because many of them have so many providers al alongside the, the supply chain that they cannot control. But on the other hand, some other companies that I've spoken to, and particularly in Silicon Valley, said that when they found out, for example, that they, in some of those companies they were using, uh, there were there was sort of forced labor or human trafficking or child labor, they just stopped them from being providers because when they mentioned, they told them, you, you, this is not acceptable. They said then, okay, I will continue doing this because this is rentable for me. So you look for another pro provider. So there are th decisions sometimes that are not easy to take eh? because I've spoken also with, with, with uh, German companies who mentioned to me, what can we do if we close our, our I mean, if we stop working with that, with that uh, provider, there's a lot of people who will lose their jobs they will be unemployed and they will go into poverty. So I think, and I, I'm always very transparent and open on this, I'm very honest. I mean, it's easier to speak <laughs> in abstract than to deal with the concrete issues that every company has to deal on the ground. The idea what, what could be, I guess, is to try to identify which are the essential issues, the, the core ones that you need to demand and which one you can work with them, as you said before, to try to support them, their capacity building, so they can really reach the best possible standards. From, and I, I like the way how you put it, because that's also something. And um, us having um, suppliers all around the globe, of course, there are the tier ones, uh, which are in a way easy to manage, because they are companies like we are. But there's a long tail of local suppliers, um, that support us um, in the countries we operate in. And then it's, I, I agree with you about having on the one hand side, clear expectations, but then also a dialogue. Because if it is just something where we would say, you don't meet our standards, so we shut you down immediately, that doesn't help the people and it doesn't help to raise the bar, but getting into a process then of identifying the gaps and finding a way how to step up towards our expectations is probably more a kind of developmental aid than um, just uh, punishing or rewarding based, based on contracts. Although it is um, a long way because it's a big world, obviously, and it's a long, long tail there. But and probably, Thomas, if I may add, add a little thing on this we have? The global framework and obviously mm -hmm. the uh, UNGPs are a global framework, but at the end, it not only needs to be translated into corporate action, but it also needs to be translated into national action. So therefore the national action plans are so important. And that's something um, where we have seen many countries in a way developing their own national action plans. And also in Germany, the fact that we are going to put um, a supply chain due diligence law into effect is part of this national action plan. But there are obviously also many countries who did not start working on this yet, or uh, where we don't have such a cohesive and comprehensive um, national action plan. So um, just as a question to you, what can be done in the next five to 10 years actually that um, there will be an increase of numbers um, of national action plans across many countries. And perhaps also what work can we as companies do to support this way? Well, as you said, some states have already embarked on notable measures to address business related human rights abuses through legislation, regulation, standard setting, discussions about business culture and, and the ways that business should treat people and the planet they live in. And as you say, in some cases, those discussions are taking place in the context of the development of a national action plan on business and human rights. Another way in which some states have made progress is inviting uh, the working group to undertake a country visit and then implementing the recommendation that the working group has presented to the Human Rights Council following the country visit. So I, in that case, even though I don't think many states are listening now, I'm always encouraging states to invite the working group to visit and to learn from the business and human rights expertise that the experts have to share. Um, guiding principle three addresses the state's regulatory and policy functions. 
And the commentary to guidance principle three says that states should not assume that businesses invariably prefer or benefit from state inaction. I mean, people tend to think that business don't want state action. Uh, and, and on the other side, we're saying no, states should consider a smart mix of measures, uh, national and international, some mandatory, some voluntary, to foster business respect for human rights. And I commend this smart mix approach to all states. And I and this is something that we have in, they have the same approach with ILO at this respect as well. Huh? And, uh, and I think that policy coherence should be at the foremost of policymakers' minds when setting up and developing policy and regulation. To speed up, you ask me, how can you speed up in the next uh, five or 10 years? I think there is a need to build on good practices that exist already and address the remaining, uh, the, the remaining coherence and governance gaps and challenge because there's still gaps and challenges. Even with national action plans, they're not perfect. And, and many of them, people thought, I mean, stakeholders, some of them thought they were not consulted enough uh, in terms of in the in the developing of this national action plan. So I think government needs to design and deliver a smart mix of effective policy and regulatory measures that not only create those level playing fields we were talking about, uh, but also lead to better outcomes for people affected by business. So people and business can benefit from them. So the last take that I think has underscored a critical point made in the UNDPs that voluntary approaches alone are not enough um, to achieve results. Mm -hmm. So I, that's why the rise of mandatory measures will undoubtedly accelerate both uptake and progress. Legal obligations and liability regimes for these types of measures will need to be carefully uh, calibrated and further clarified to avoid divergent or arbitrary interpretation or unintended consequences such as a checkbox due diligence approaches, which must never be allowed, or, or for example, empty promises for effective remedies for victims when harms occur. So I think um, mandatory human rights due diligence is an important element in promoting responsible business conduct and setting expectations for corporate uh, behavior. So it's a key component of a smart mix. And we're seeing, you mentioned it, of course, uh, the, there is a, uh, due diligence legislation coming from the EU, Germany, Netherlands, and Norway, in addition to that already in place in France. And progress also underway in Finland, Mexico, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United UK. So however, all of these positive development, if I may say, are patchy. <laughs> uh, and, and they need to be followed with greater attention and uh, uh, to ensure meaningful due diligence is aligned with the requirements of the UNDP. So at the UN level, for example, uh, progress is on the way towards a legally binding instrument. This is something that when I discussed with companies, they said that we don't want a treaty body on this. And I said to them, well, if you follow the UN guidance principle, maybe they won't be asking, uh, and maybe uh, uh, the people are not asking for a treaty body. So I think there is a space to, but some states feel that the companies are not doing the right thing and they want to have a legally binding instrument. So um, I, I think the UNGP on the other side recognize the potential and the need of effort by multiple actors, of course states, but, but also to, that frame policies and practices that shape business conduct, but also the, the, com the commitment of businesses, but also the participation of other people uh, and, 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 and to listen, I would say. And I, th I think it would be good to the companies as well to listen to those who have felt harmed by business practices like uh, human rights defenders, indigenous people, individuals and communities. And I think that could be a first ingredient in listening to them and trying to create change that could be pos uh, positive for the company, but also for the people. And that they can take measures before the damage became, became irreparable. And together, I think we should reinforce the key message that respect for human rights is possible and will make a major contribution to realizing sustainable development. And this is something the working group and others have emphasized this connection. So, so it's not that we're talking in different, in completely different sort of a, a death talk. No, I think we, the majority of the people who are committed uh, understand the importance of it. Uh, everybody understand that only voluntary measures is not enough, but we need voluntary measures and we need the, the commitment of businesses. 
And the other thing that I think the working group has been engaging in, and I have participated in many of those, is promoting regional and sub-regional forums on business and human rights, and in, the in order to further disseminate the UNGPs, because we, need, we don't need only the convinced one, we need to reach out to many more companies so they can all be able to be part of this, of this path. So building on this, and as a last question, um, you spoke a lot about it's important to listen, and I agree to this, and it's important to have something like a coalition of the willing who voluntarily move ahead um, actually to raise the bar, and I also agree that is not sufficient because that's what we see. It is great if one company in one industry establishes a triple gold standard, but if you take yourself out of the market then due to like a uh, different price uh, level compared to your competitors, then the customers will often go where the money is. And um, it doesn't help just to be the only one being on the triple gold scale, but we need to raise the bar collectively. And you mentioned also the role of NGOs or of stakeholders in general. And there is obviously the capital market, the public, uh, policymakers, the unions, NGOs. And today we are here um, more in a setup of employers. Um, and uh, talking about this stakeholder dialogue or talking about like the World Economic Forum puts it stakeholder capitalism. So what would be your thoughts around having an open stakeholder dialogue on these matters um, across all of the different stakeholder groups? So what would be a best in class um, principle or a wish you could address to us how it should look like? Well, I think it's a great idea. And I think the UN can be a combining power with with the with the, with the different stakeholders. Uh, I've been in I, I, on this um, issue. I mean, some things can be seen in some way or another. I remember participating in Davos on the illegal fishing, and I saw some uh, some Nordic countries, for example, who what they did is that in the can of tuna or salmon, they can, they have so the tracing records from the fishermen where they took it and all the elements to, to ensure to people that that product was safe, what did not include child labor, forced labor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, a, if I may say like an environmental issue, like a green stamp, that means that this is health good for the planet, for the people. And I think it's a great thing to make a big dialogue on, on multiple stakeholders. And that's why we pretend to produce in the Forum of Human Rights and Business that at the beginning was mainly states and uh, communities. But uh, I think that the, percent, that the, the presence of uh, businesses has been increasing. I, and I think this is a good possible uh, place, but could be other. And, and then we, everybody can learn and, and discuss the issues and can have this conversation to identify what else can be done or, or how we can do better. But one thing that I have learned, and also when I did the regulations in my government on, on, on healthy food accordingly, uh, and we had to put this, you know, like this colors in, in the food, if it's too, if it was too high in, in the sugar and in, in fat and in salt, at the beginning, companies felt so threatened about that. Huh? And at the end, no, and because people care and children care and they tell their fathers to buy this on this product. Or the other example that I had when I included in my uh, in, in the in the reform of the uh, in the, the tax reform that um, uh, beverage without with less sugar, accordingly to our WHO as well, will have to pay less taxes or some on. I mean. My good friend, the CEO from the Coca-Cola, called me and said, oh, this is impossible. And one year later, they told me, you know what? Now we have created a huge market on, uh, on all kinds of healthy products, and it's doing pretty well. So I think a good conversation can be from policymakers and decision makers at the state, at the business moment, with community, because I think there's a lot of good examples that it can be very beneficial for everyone. And of course, our, the Forum for Business and Human Rights and the Working Group, if, it's, if you consider it's a good possibility, we can work on that. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that was extremely insightful. And of course, I in particular like the idea of tracking and tracing um, um, across the supply chain. Let's call it the quality of, of a good, because that's something we do um, already in logistics with our tracking and tracing solutions. But there can be much more was a great conversation and um, again appreciation that you shared us for this conference today 
Now I have to hand back to you, Nicole, doesn't, don't I? Exactly. Thank you very much, Thomas, for being here on stage and engaging in this conversation with Michelle. We will now do a little break um, where I'm going to ask Michelle two questions from the audience. So please stay online, Michelle, um, while we are um, adding one more table here on the stage. So Farouk was asking, um, how does UN want to orient UNGP at ground level, especially among the enterprises? It is not known by many of the ground level partners. I think this is a question to Michelle. Oh, I see she already disconnected, so fine. And um, we will get the answers then to you um, to be answers uh, in, in writing. Um, just two more seconds, then we will also um, welcome our next panel here on the stage. Um, just waiting for a few moments to complete the beverages and also the speakers. Um, to have their wirings uh, ready. So the next panel we are discussing um, is about the decent work and global supply chains, what needs to happen. And um, this is a panel which we will also in, do in a mixed conversation online and offline. And um, first I would like to welcome the moderator of this panel to join me on stage here. Um, Mr. Roberto Suarez Sanchez, who is the Secretary General of the IOE. Please welcome Roberto. I can be here, yes. You know, my problem is that I'm not used to hybrid meetings. Please come here, Martha and Angela. Well, you can sit one on the right and okay. another one on the left oh, okay. with no special meaning because <laughs> beyond that. So my main challenge is that we are not used to hybrid meetings and all of a sudden we discovered that there are meetings that are you know, face to face and we have to deal not just with the new technology, but also to be looking to the, to the screen at the same time that you have to use your notebook, at the same time that you have to be aware that there are perhaps some questions that come from there, but another one from there. And it's quite challenging. So I, first of all, I have to ask for your uh, indulgence in this, uh, in this setting. Uh, the topic that we have to deal with now is global supply chains, is this in work, is totally related to the previous conversations that we have heard from Olivier and from, and from Michelle. Michelle, uh, uh, the human rights special representative. Uh, but I would like, before we start, to thank the three participants. And I see Fernanda also joining uh, virtually. Uh, welcome, Fernanda. Thank you also for making the effort. A special thank you for Angela. I have to say that Angela, the deputy director of the WTO, she has been working in her position for nine months, if I'm not wrong, more or less. We have invited her three times. She has always said yes. And we really appreciate this effort because it says a lot about her engagement also with the business community, but also her engagement on the topic that we are dealing with, which is trade, employment, trade SDGs, trade, decent work and human rights. And I think that's also a sign. And also the fact that you came here uh, with such a busy agenda in, in, in Bonn, which uh, I think is, uh, is a nice place, but it's a little bit uh, hidden for some of us uh, in terms of connections. Also says, says a lot, of, I want to thank you uh, especially, but also to Martha Newton, uh, who is another Deputy Director General. Uh, perhaps I deal more often with uh, Martha than with you, Angela, <laughs> because in ILO we have a special role as we are co-deciders of decisions in the ILO. So Martha has to bear me very often. <laughs> when we are not happy. And I can tell you that one area in which we are not always happy is global supply chains and decent work. So we have to say what we have to say very often. Mm -hmm. We have uh, sometimes to be very critical with documents from the office, 
uh, sometimes less critical than the last one that has been produced recently. I think that is a much more balanced approach than the one we had before. But again, Martha is some, a, a, a profile that really listens, that is always trying to integrate the different perspectives of employers and workers, of governments. And I can tell you, it's crazy. It's really crazy to have a consensus approach as the one that you have also in WTO. Uh, to have all together and trying to push an agenda in which we have a strong, a strong outcome. Fernanda, you are new in the human rights working group, but uh, I have to say that the human rights working group with IOE and also with the business community in general have always had an approach of engaging us as business community. And I know that it's not easy because it's very often the case that when we, we go to the business and human rights forums, we find ourselves, and I'm not exaggerating, I don't know whether there is anyone from an NGO listening to us, we find ourselves very much exposed. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to build a trustful relationship. We have to. We have to engage with different stakeholders, but it's not always easy because we come from different worlds. And having people like uh, Fernanda and all the members of the working group helping us on this path, is critically important. I'm not here as a moderator to, to provide an intervention on, on decent work and, and global supply chains, but I would like just to very briefly remind uh, the context. And in order to remind the context, we should not go just to the directive, the Euro, uh, European Union directive of due diligence or the discussions that we have in the ILO. I think that it's worth to know that we come here for uh, from a long distance. And uh, remember that in 1998, we already had a big discussion. Uh, I was coming for the first time to the ILO, but we had already a big discussion on what was called the globalization phenomenon, the, the globalization, which means all, all these rounds of trade integration through the multilateral system and the WTO, and whether we should have a kind of social clause in multilateral trade agreements. Uh, from the business community, many were very much against this social closed, and I have to be very frank with you. But IOE took an initiative within the ELO, and that's why it's so important, this connection, to launch, and I say the IOE because it was the employer side, even though, well, then we have also the, the, the support of other constituents, of course, to just put in value those fundamental principles are right at work, that should be fulfilled whatever you have or not ratified an ILO convention. Whenever you operate as, uh, as business, even though these principles apply, meaning by that labor should not be a commodity. Labor is, is, is not for something you, you deal with a, with a trade purpose. And you have to have some fair play, which is based among others, in these fundamental principles and right to work. Of course, we have an evolution. And, uh, and, and now, by the way, we're going to discuss health and safety as a fundamental principle and right. And that's the nightmare now of Martha, <laughs> because we need to have a consensus, which is not going to be easy before June or in June. And so this idea of fundamental principles and rights is, is growing. But in the middle, we have the path of the business and human rights principles and the John Ruggie uh, you know, uh, uh, what we call John Ruggie principles, and, uh, and uh, we have also to, to, to pay tribute to him. He died last year in coincidence with the 10th anniversary. But this has given us a kind of another leverage, another, you know, uh, point of reference, which is important. And I remember very much the debate that we had whether uh, CSR, social responsibility, is compulsory, is vol voluntary. Uh, whether there, I mean, no, nobody discussed now that the expectations that the stakeholders or the society has on business in terms of fulfilling some basics beyond also my own operations, beyond also, you know, my daily operation is something that you cannot consider as optional. No? Uh, not, not necessarily a legal thing, but not optional. And that's, that's the, the scenario we have now. But of course, there are important challenges. Uh, sometimes the impression we have, at least in the business community, is the expectations that are placed on the business side are so high 
that is going to lead to a kind of frustration because we we as business uh, individual companies but also local companies cannot deal with all the problems with all the deficits on decent work in supply chains mm -hmm. and there is also the 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 duty to the duty to preserve the the the, the pillar mm -hmm. applying to governments that we have where we have the feeling that there is no so much progress being undertaken if you have weak institutions, if you have corruption, if you have big informality, it's very difficult for a single company to make progress. So, mm -hmm. so that's the context I want to refer to. Uh, we would also need to mention the pandemic and how the pandemic has affected trade and global supply chains. The fall of trade has been incredible. Uh, I don't know whether the WTO has a recent report. I just read the, re the report of the OECD and, and it, the fall was so intense that it goes back to the second world war to see some, some drop of trade, but it's been recovering also quite quickly. But the main fear that we have, there's going to be a backlash in issues like child labor, mm -hmm. even gender, even, you know, so we have two questions for the three of you, and I'm not going to do a kind of separate question one after the other. I'm going to raise the two questions for, for you all together, and you answer them. And if there is more things that came to our mind, not just to my mind, I will, I will, I will ask them again. The first question is, I don't remember exactly the order. I think the first question is linked to decent work deficits. I mean, uh, decent work deficits, that's a word that is used in some language uh, for my law, whether that was also, by the way, some, some controversial concept, but, but that has been uh, so, to some extent overcome, um, is there, and there is a, a risk of, of that deepening. What business can do more? I mean, it's basically the, one of the questions that have been raised before, I think, by, by you, Olivier. Um, but and, and what is the role of your respective organizations and also the working group to help us also in this, in this, uh, uh, in this challenge? And the other question, which is equally important and sometimes very much forgotten, is how we can unleash the potential of trade to create employment. Something that we some, sometimes, sorry, Martha, it's not no, your no, fault. We forget, <laughs> for, we forget in the ILO and in other discussions, trade integration and ideally through the multilateral system brings decent job. Mm -hmm. brings innovation, bring also skills, brings social welfare. Of course, you need some conditions, but how can we do better for trade to bring these conditions uh, that are necessary to unleash this potential? So those are the questions. I stop here, I shut up, and I start <laughs> <laughs> with Angela. Thank you again for coming. Well, thank you very much, Roberto. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a great pleasure to be here today um, with Martha, with Fernanda, um, and with a live audience, which is it's just terrific to, to be with a live audience. And of course, those who are um, watching uh, uh, virtually as well. Um, Roberto, you, you just listed so many different questions <laughs> and thoughts. I, I, I really uh, hardly know where to start. Um, I think I would start by talking about multilateralism for just one second, because I think right now, particularly with the war in Ukraine, there is just so much pressure right now on the multilateral system. The multilateral system is something we cannot take for granted. And it has, I think, it just brings so much to the table in terms of an ability to look at issues. Um, in an ability to, to bring everyone to the table, no matter if they're large countries or small, big market powers or small, different forms of government. So I, I, I make that point and then pivot, I think, to the particular role of multilateralism when it comes to human rights and sustainability and decent work, all of these concepts that you are mentioning, because obviously, multilateralism has such a huge, a huge role. Now, when it comes to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, um, and when it comes to trade more broadly, um, I, I think there, there are some huge challenges that we're facing. And, and I was very struck by some of the comments, Thomas, that you made uh, about the business community and how things have changed so much. Roberto, your point about what happened in 1998 
and what happened um, in uh, uh, the Singapore ministerial, the Seattle ministerial of the WTO, where there was this huge fight by the business community, this huge resistance to dealing with these particular issues of decent work and the supply chain. And now that has changed, but it's not, it's changed perhaps from the big companies and maybe for some of the small and medium sized ones, but it's not universal yet. And so what we see is a lot of pressure by, by governments to try to resolve the issue and to impose standards using whatever tools they have. Um, we see the uh, due diligence effort that's emerging in the, in the EU that's well advanced in the EU. In the US, a bit of a different approach um, in terms of supply chains and trying to cleanse them through uh, import bans and through transparency requirements that go pretty deep um, and pretty far back. So, so these are some of the ways, um, I think, when it comes to trade that governments can, can deal with, with the situation. Now, when it comes to multilateral institutions, I'll, I'll speak to the WTO, um, it's a challenge here too. We don't really have consensus that these types of issues are appropriate to deal with at the WTO, that they're not really trade issues per se. Now, we have a lot of governments, a lot of members who, who really are pushing to expand this. One example, we have a negotiation that's ongoing right now with respect to fisheries subsidies. And in, in distant water fishing, that is one area where there is a tremendous abuse um, of, of labor, of use of forced labor, in fact. And so the U.S. has made a proposal to try to address that issue. And, and I'm glad to say that there is, I think, an emerging consensus. But there are still many countries who oppose this. So my point is, if, if this is an area that the business community feels strongly about, that governments feel strongly about, you need to help our multilateral institutions like the WTO take a broader role because we don't have that consensus right now. We are a member-driven organization. That means if any one member doesn't like the approach, they can stop it from moving forward. And I think that when it comes to issues like the supply chain and making sure that the supply chain doesn't have uh, doesn't have forced labor, to try to eliminate unsustainability, um, to try to improve conditions of work, decent work. When it comes to those things, there's a lot that can be done that's not threatening. I think that it's something that I know so many are committed to doing, but I, I think at the same time, there's the sense by the opponents that there is no place in the trade world for these types of issues. Human rights, trade, entirely separate considerations. Um, so my, my request is that if you feel strongly about the WTO taking a more active role, then we really need to, to hear that and to see that and to be able to demonstrate that we can do so in an effective way. There are a couple of ways that we can go about this. In, in terms of approach. One is labor standards, trying to actually impose particular standards, whether they are the ILO conventions, the ILO declaration, or something else. Another way is through transparency and creating through, through trade, through the nature of trade, more transparency in the process um, more uh, knowledge of what's going on in the process, more requirements to be uh, open about what the nature of the supply chain is. So those are a couple of different approaches that we can, uh, that we can uh, be working on. But this is all building blocks. It depends on the business community. It depends on the NGO community and civil society. It depends on national governments. It depends on groups like the G7 and the G20. Uh, the G7 has been very active on this in particular, as has the G20. And then also our multilateral institutions. We really uh, do want to stay relevant. Um, and we do want to make sure that trade is responsible. 
Um, and that, it, but at the same time, we have to be uh, realistic about what we can achieve and how. And then one last point that I would make relates to supply chains um, as a whole. Roberto, you kind of pointed to this. The concept of supply chains is politically under fire um, in domestic governments, but, but also um, at the WTO as well, where there is a perception that supply chains um, is really the, the corporate answer to uh, addressing the bottom line, making sure that everything is as cheap as possible, that it works out for business, and who cares about the rest. So supply chains themselves are under fire. And this, this concept of reshoring, everything should be made domestically. I know we hear this a lot in the United States and in the EU, for example, um, that everything should be made domestically. Um, or if we're going to go out, it should be nearshoring or friendshoring but not the same kind of supply chains that we've seen before, particularly before the pandemic. So I think it's the pandemic, but I think it's also some of these other issues about people being left behind in trade that's put the concept of supply chains under threat. And obviously supply chains are essential to trade and trade is essential to job creation, creating good jobs. We all know that jobs that are that are tied to exports pay more, they're better jobs. Uh, we know too the ties to gender and trade that when, uh, when you look at, at trade, those jobs um, are, are better jobs for women. They move out of the uh, informal sector as you were saying into the formal sector. So that's I, 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 my two, my two uh, wishes um, is it, you know, to help us address the question of uh, secure supply chains, but to also help us defend the nature, the value of supply chains themselves. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. Uh, a spontaneous <laughs> Thank you. Which I have a question for you, but later, because okay. I want to hear the others. And yes. of course, I'm also looking to all of you that want to also. Um, Fernanda. Um, what are your views on, again, in, two, in these two questions, how can we engage further? How can we be much more effective? Uh, also, how can you help us also for, with others that uh, uh, perhaps are not so on the earth or uh, so realistic or pragmatic also? Because we, we need also this side, okay? It's not just everything about regulation. It's, it's also about implementation and how we build trust with other stakeholders. So how, how can we go walk together on this path for effective partnerships on human rights. Hi, everybody. Hear me okay? Uh, we cannot hear you here. I don't know why. Are you? Can you hear me? No. Hmm. We heard you at the very beginning and then you disappeared all of a sudden. Hello, hello. Now, yes. Now, yes. So good afternoon in Bonn. Uh, greetings from Mexico City. The sun is coming up behind me. Uh, uh -huh. It's great to be joining you. I would love to be there. I wasn't able to travel this time, but I hope to, to see you in, per in person very soon. And I really appreciate the invitation to be here with you this morning, this afternoon for you. Um, so about your questions, um, Roberto, and I was also uh, listening to Angela and I would have a few comments on a few of the things she was she was bringing to the table but I, I I want to stress something that the high commissioner said in the previous session that it's that the UNGPs the UN guiding principles are the common framework we have I think on on this matter of business and human rights and uh, it has provided us with you know common language and I think there are many elements there that can address some of the issues related to you know supply chains and doesn't work of course combined with the other instruments and frameworks and guidances that we have from other institutions definitely ILO but also OECD and also at the national levels um, particularly on you know how to engage I think that um, I mean due diligence it's of course uh, a key element of pillar two, you might uh, 
you know, recall that the UNDPs are organized in three pillars and pillar two is particularly um, geared towards the responsibility of business to respect human rights. And, and human rights due diligence is the way, the means to accomplish that. Um, and I think that this is, this might be a bit more, uh, you know, easy or intuitive for larger companies to accomplish, of course. And, and, um, and I think that that is why engaging with different actors throughout the supply chain is very important. Um, I know that there are many challenges, you know, downstream and, and working with, you know, local providers many times from the perspective of the big kind of multinational enterprises, but I, I think there are many opportunities there of engagement as well. Um, and um, in, again, in the previous session, I was hearing that um, many times there is this pressure to kind of cut cold commercial relationships if, you know, some, some of the, the, the providers or, you know, or the companies that are part of a supply chain are not complying with due diligence or not complying with the UNGPs or with, you know, labor standards and regulations and so on. I think, uh, of course, this is a potential path, but it's, it's much more useful to engage with this, with, you know, the, the, the different components of the supply chains. And, uh, you know, as stated in the, in the French uh, law on due diligence, they actually state the duty of care. It's not just due diligence, but it's really looking along the supply chain and seeing where the you know, the, the weak, let's say, components of the chain are and how can, you know, the bigger companies support those. I remember, you know, when the, well, even before the Rana Plaza disaster, and, you know, this was a, a huge, um, again, tragedy in the garment sector in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, I remember even before that, you know, civil society, trade unions, engaging with the brands, with the big garment brands, you know, um, saying, you know, you need to be looking at that. Something is gonna happen. And it did, right? And it's a shared responsibility from the brands in their lack of, of accomplishing that duty of care. But of course, the local provider that was hiring people in very precarious conditions and in dangerous, in a dangerous location, actually, and of course, the national government. So it's, you know, a combination of responsibilities. So I think that engagement is, is very important and, and it can contribute to it. And that brings me to actually one of the elements of the UNGP plus 10 roadmap. You know, last year, the guiding principles turned 10 and uh, the working group worked with different stakeholders on developing a roadmap for the next decade. And one very important discussion that we're gonna actually carry on, and we're having a small expert consultation at the end of the month in Mexico, it's about capacity building. And I think this is an essential discussion that should continue and, and we should definitely deepen, go really deep in that conversation. And that should happen with all stakeholders and definitely the business sector, employers are essential in this conversation because we're trying to really impact what is needed in terms of capacity building in all, you know, um, at all levels and with all stakeholders to really push forward the implementation of UNGPs. So I think definitely multi-stakeholder engagement is another element, you know. Uh, I would always encourage the business to listen, you know, to local organization, to workers or trade unions, um, because they have that information. They can really understand what are the challenges together, of course, with the business owners at the local level. But I think that that engagement with, and I know it's challenging, Roberto, and we've talked about it is in many spaces and, and building trust among sectors is really a challenge, but I think it's, of utmost importance, it's paramount to really advance the business of human rights uh, agenda. Of course, transparency and disclosure, as Angela was bringing to the table, I think it's a very important element. Um, I, I think you know there is a lot of opportunity when 
we come to the trade agenda. I was thinking of the USMCA, right? The new trade agreement between U the US, Canada and Mexico. And there we have some very good examples of, you know, provisions around labor rights and decent work and even new mechanisms uh, for accountability. And I think that it's a, a really interesting example when it comes to trade uh, to be looking at. And it didn't undermine actually the, you know, the potential of the commercial potential, the trade potential of the agreement actually. I think it, it brought new important elements that on labor, on decent work standards, but also on, you know, uh, climate change and this other very important discussions. So, and finally, I don't want to go longer. One last <laughs> sentence. I, I really want to stress the, the key role of business associations. So I'm very happy to be here today. I think that business associations, IOE, for example, has a lot of, you know, chapters, members at the national level that are actually there on the ground working with SMEs, you know, so SMEs are actually part of IOE. So I think, um, I think there is a key role there for building capacities, pushing the agenda forward uh, and engaging at different levels. Uh, so, I mean, the working group has all the disposition to continue these conversations, to continue engaging with you uh, at the international level, but also, you know, with national chapters or at the regional levels. So, um, I'll stop here and let's, okay. let's carry on. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Fernanda, also for uh, for being there so early in Mexico, by the way. Um, we will keep engaging with you. Of, of course, also the role of employers and business organization is, I think, is important also. Uh, Marta, last but not least, eh? <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to, f the question you have there, is your time Abs sure absolutely and and just uh, in talking about how uh, we can uh, address decent work deficits on the ground uh, that are located deep down in global supply chains um, first of all i always want to stop and think it's it's really important to always recognize where we came from because i just read yesterday i read the 1998 uh, transcript from 1998 i sat down and read it it read like a telenovela in terms of how the drama of getting to uh, fundamental principles and rights at work when it originally came in and, and so where we are today is a very different place and i always just say for a second we should even though there are many challenges we should celebrate that in our work and people and, the, and particularly the employers that stepped up and did that work it's really vitally important but but i would say at the ilo we we have a general rule, and I don't think that we're the only ones, that, that working conditions in supply chains reflect you know, so many different things, whether it's the, the broader environment of any different country or region, um, the actions of different actors, as we've heard, whether it's the workers, the employers, governments, um, and as well as specific characteristics of, of each sector. So for example, you know, just the reality, agriculture work tends to be a lot more dangerous, and, and some sectors tend to be less regulated than, than in other parts of the world. But I think we're hearing this theme, and I would echo it, that decent work, uh, you know, being able to have decent work in supply chains, it's intertwined with the overall strength of governance and exercise of rights and the dynamics between uh, the different stakeholders in the industries. And, and I'll, I think that we see some of these most high profile cases in supply chains, whether it's child labor and cobalt, which is rightly high profile in, in nature because of its reality, but it, it's also linked to something that is so tangible to so many customers. But in many supply chains, the issues of, that you find upstream are, are not readily understandable, the more broader socioeconomic issues. And I'm sure many of you on these issues encounter many people and, and many well-intentioned organizations who care deeply about supply chains, but they may not truly understand supply chains and, and the reality of how they're linked to the broader economic and social issues and that it's really hard practically impossible for for any one company to get their arms around those issues um, i think informality is probably probably one of the broader i mean the the majority of, of of workers in the world in the in the informal sector and and it's not understood or it's linked to the lack of, of social protection and, and why that is so important or you know discrimination against minorities that confines 
and, and women that confine them perhaps to particular positions or, or the specificity of working conditions. Uh, so I think probably we've heard, and I think Angela alluded to the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the conversation around supply chains, you know, the, just the reality and the, the situation that we're in. But I also think sometimes, you know, it gets a little oversimplified. And, and that can be uh, that can be problematic in in so many so many different ways. It's it's much more con uh, complicated than that. So I would say first the concept of leverage is, is really important uh, in the idea of, of of supply chains and due diligence and, and what it what it can accomplish. But we really look at our work in supply chains at the ILO. Uh, we we think about opportunity as an entry point with our constituents. And that doesn't mean we sometimes have some bumpy roads along that as we're seeking the path to common opportunity that works for all. But um, you know, we're a normative organization, uh, government, workers, employers. I always say there is, a, uh, there is a beauty and a beast to it. A beauty because if we can work on a common strategy that can reflect all uh, parties, you can really affect change on the ground that's better for business, better for workers, and you know, help governments serve the appropriate role that they should be serving. Um, and I think, as, as Roberto alluded to, uh, our, our fundamental principles of rights of work, um, which you all are so familiar with, forced, no forced labor, no child labor, uh, protecting uh, discrimination, also uh, freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining, and now we're in the process of determining a possible fifth fundamental principle and right at work on occupational safety and health. And we'll be taking this up uh, alongside Ro the, Roberto and his colleagues in, in June. But where, what I've heard and what I've heard both from uh, Michelle and, and, and Angela and Fernanda and our other speakers is about this collaboration and the importance of technical capacity for the opportunity to see how we address a decent work and supply chains, especially further upstream, a ways that we can work collectively together uh, as stakeholders to be able to focus specifically on action that can make make a difference. So, you know, when we're thinking about, um, you know, when individual enterprises can use what they leverage, uh, you know, what they have with their business with their business partners, you know, to prevent or or remedy adverse impact of workplaces in the supply chain, and with the right right engagement, uh, we can make a real impact for change. And I'll just give an example uh, that we have a program called the Vision Zero Fund, and I mentioned it too because it came out of uh, it came out of uh, Germany, and uh, as far as through an action in the, in in the multilateral system. And the, the Vision Zero Fund, you know, we what it, it does is we're striving for for zero and and fatal work related incidents, injuries, and disease in global supply chains, and how we get to there. So it's really really broad. And we've worked in a variety of sectors. I mean, we've worked in agriculture, textiles, um, ginger in Myanmar, coffee in Colombia. But we really, what we do is we bring employers, workers, governments, buyers, we bring everyone to the table. And we basically say, look, we all have a stake in what happens here. And so how do we look at the major OSH issues that the particular you know, sector might be facing? What are the things that are driving the problems and what are the things that are con the constraints to fixing those problems? You know, and, and here's what's going on at the workplace, at the country level, you know, what, what as far as the, as the government is doing about it, and then also at, at the global level, and how can we work uh, together to deal with it? And I think for us, because of the ILO's uh, convening power, we get stakeholders together. It's, it's often roadmaps, it's, it's not always smooth, but we work to focus, on a, to focus on agreeing on a way forward so that labor and rights issues and supply chains are really addressed in a sustainable way. And I would say that that root cause work is never easy, but if you ask me, it is one of the best investments. And we have so many examples uh, that, uh, whether it's you know the Vision Zero Fund, whether it's the Better Work Program, where we can show when we bring 
you know, all the actors together to the table to do what I call the messy work, to really, you know, get to what those root issues are. You know, you, you see so many benefits that benefit the variety of constituents, uh, you know, making the workplace safer, but also for businesses with, you know, with better work, we see it also is increased productivity when we addressed all these things together. So there actually ended up being a business case uh, for investing in this work. But I think probably as far as international labor standards, uh, you know, that, that in an ideal scenario, if, you know, international labor standards were being applied effectively, we, we wouldn't need to be having these conversations. But, um, but as the guiding principles point out, you know, the failure of pillar one to protect, it doesn't absolve pillar two of the, the duty to respect. And so, uh, you know, there's, there, this is something I think that we're getting back to leverage that I really think the, the European Commission is, is focusing on in, in, the new, uh, in the new draft directive on mandatory diligence, that really combining work together with meaningful stakeholder engagement is really the critical, the critical step forward. Um, and when it comes to the government piece, because this is a merely missing piece, and Roberta, you alluded to it, we have to, and we at the ILO, I mean, if you don't have effective rule of law, if you don't have a functioning labor inspectorate, if you don't have these things, you, it, it, I mean, you, you're, as far as business and, and what's been uh, asked of you in terms of to, to help address these issues, to help, uh, you know, at the ILO, we very much see that investing with government governments to make them, you know, having to step up to strengthen the mechanisms that support workplaces are um, absolutely essential. So, you know, I, I think as we, we were heading towards a very interesting time with, uh, with regards to, you know, how we address a decent work, but I think, you know, again, my collective action is key. And for, for us, because we're the ILO, we're tripartite, we work with IOE, we work with ITUC every day. It's like, it's our, it's our air, it's what we breathe every day. Um, you know, it's very common to us as an organization. And, and I think that we're gonna be able to play an essential role, Roberto, and particularly as we come as an organization this summer uh, to develop our strategy on uh, supply chains moving forward as an organization and, and a strategic plan. It's really where we're gonna have to roll up our sleeves and make help that that collective action makes a difference. Thank you, thank you so much. I have been told by my team that we don't have much time, but I want just to open the floor for quick questions. If not, I will raise quick questions for you for quick answers, very, very quick answers. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, if you can introduce yourself. Yes, to Samuel, uh, thank you. Samsung. My name is Monique Gerson, representing Samsung Electronics. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really insightful. I actually have a question um, to the ILO. Um, looking at the current situation that we are in, geopolitically a conflict, um, if we look at the example of Uzbekistan, how do you see this as a good practice example for, for other uh, countries with a weak rule of law uh, moving forward? Sure. Um, thank you so much. I mean, Uzbekistan and the work of cotton is a really strong example. Um, it's just one of, of the examples that, that we have at the ILO. I think, um, you know, for, for us, and I think when you looked at, at um, Uzbekistan, it, it's really looking in countries where, where governance, you know, it's not particularly strong and, and, and social safety nets are inadequate. Um, and you see, and particularly the time we're in now where supply chain disruptions and lockdowns have impacted more than just manufacturing, um, you, you look at, you have to look at all the issues. And I think for, for Uzbekistan, it, it was looking at the strategies that, you know, what all, where all the impacts were. And it was, you know, not just as far as the producing cotton, we looked at the impact on the, the shops that those workers shopped at the villages that they sent money home to, um, the fabric makers ability uh, to book or sell cotton orders and, and farmers ability uh, to repay debts. So, you know, I, I think for me, um, as we're looking at, you know, how we keep continuing to look at these impacts upstream, uh, you know, even if the leverage seem lo low, at, at this point, you know, we've seen whether it's, the, the COVID impact of the COVID pandemic, 
or the, the, the crisis in Ukraine, which is just one of the many crises of the world, that we that we have this kind of great what we call this great divergence. You know, we're seeing these kind of you know two two worlds. I, I don't have an easy answer, but to say that we you know we also have to really get better at how we adjust these models for crisis and conflict. Um, which is something, uh, you know, yesterday uh, or day before yesterday at the ILO, uh, we, we produced a manual on how, uh, from a worker's uh, perspective, on a crisis and conflict, navigating a crisis and conflict is disasters. And so I think being able to strengthen these types of tools is, is going to be essential. But I, I do think this, our work is not going to, you know, you know stop. I think what, what many of these incidents do is they lay bare the problems that already exist. COVID did it with women. I mean, the impact of the pandemic has a feminine face. I mean, quite frankly. So we see many d decent work deficits that always were there, but they've, they've been exposed and didn't stop because all of a sudden there wasn't childcare, there wasn't availability, you know, and you saw, you now saw the impact. And now what's happening? We have women who are leaving the labor market in, in record, record numbers. So I, I think we're still, you know, we're still trying to monitor these things in real time. Um, there's no, I, I don't think there's one fix or another. It's trying to get, and I think as Fernando was saying, listen to the people on the ground. It's absolutely key. Listen to the workers, the employers. I mean, sometimes we're in Geneva. That can be the bubble within the bubble within the bubble. And it's really important that at the, at the ground level, at the national level, we have to, my, I feel like at the ILO, if our, if we're not, uh, making policy that is going to translate into impactful change that makes real tangible action on the ground, uh, then, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's good to write papers and have a policy, but we have to make, have a difference in human beings lives. And so that's what I'm focused on at the ILO every day. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Martha. Uh, is there any other question before we go to the other panel. I, I would just uh, raise one point for you and then we, we, we finish. Is shouldn't we communicate better jointly the benefits of trade integration through multilateralism? I think, I think that's, that's a recurring yes. point because I, I mean, and uh, uh, Fernanda, very quickly, eh? no more than one minute each, is w uh, what can we do for the first pillar? As I said before, there's no enough progress on the first pillar, at least that's the feeling we have. And how, I, how could, can we act together also for this duty to protect in the same path as the duty to respect and the due diligence and the access to remedy? So if you can both, you have already had your question, Martha. <laughs> so if you can both answer quickly this question sure. I would have to say before we close. Okay, and, uh, we'll be we very quick. <laughs> um, we definitely need to communicate the benefits of trade better. Um, I think that I, I won't go into the statistics. You all know them from the perspective of your own companies, why trade is important. But I think it's, it, it's important not just to show those statistics, but to be realistic about the risks that trade does cause. We have to be honest about that and about how we want to solve those problems. Um, I think that gives us a lot more credibility when we talk about the value of trade. That's a good point. Fernanda, your one minute. <laughs> sure. Uh, this is a big question, but um, there was also a question on, on the chat about pillar three. And I do think that Sometimes this is the pillar we're overseeing. I mean, not seeing actually, uh, overlooking. I, I, I think that um, there is a lot to be done with states, definitely. A lot of work to do at the national level. This is part of the capacity building challenges. It's not only capacity building for businesses or, you know, or for civil society or trade unions on these issues, but it's definitely working with states hand in hand to kind of push them not only to, to develop a national action plan, there are many ways in which UNGPs can be embedded into the national domestic laws, regulations, institutions, and policies. So I think um, engaging with states is definitely important. And we're gonna be talking about responsible political engagement on the side of business um, in, our, uh, global, uh, in our general assembly report. So 
I'll, I'll, I'll call you very soon on this particular matter. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all. And thank you also for your patience because we went a little bit farther. But uh, <laughs> I think that all the panelists deserve a good clap of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert, Gertu, for facilitating the session, and then Angela and Martha for joining us here in Bonn physically, as well as Fernanda from Mexico, mm -hmm. with great insight from a different perspective. So thank you. Now our next panel will be completely online. And at the same time, we will change the scene here slightly. So I would like to first welcome now the facilitator of the next panel, the moderator, which is Renate Hornung Draus. Uh, she's the BDA Hello. Managing Director of Economic and International Affairs, as well as the IOE Vice President for the ILO. Welcome, Renate. Hello. And thank you very much um, for this um, excellent um, conference here with very high level speakers. And um, let me start this session right away by saying that um, exactly this is a hybrid conference and uh, we are pleased to see many of you sitting in the very nice location of Deutsche Post, DHL. Um, and thank you, Deutsche Post, for hosting this. Uh, really very good. At the same time, we want to make it as interactive as possible also for the colleagues who have been joining from around the world. Let me say that we have more than 150 virtual participants from uh, really around the globe, starting from Latin America right to Southeast Asia, Japan, and so on. And so we would really, I would really like to make this as interactive as possible and also to integrate this global perspective, this in, in, international perspective into our discussion, which however will be rather on a regional instrument, the EU supply chain directive as it is prepared now. And um, what does this mean for businesses? Um, and what does it mean for businesses around the world? And I'm very pleased to introduce to you the uh, panel. First of all, um, Heidi Hautala, uh, Vice President of the European Parliament. Um, Heidi has been a member of the European Parliament for many, many years. I remember in the 1990s when I was Director of Social Affairs at uh, UNICE, which later became Business Europe, we already had dealings together. And it's a great pleasure to see you again here, Heidi Hautala. And uh, just for all of you for information, Heidi is the Vice President of the European Parliament representing the Greens and the EFA Group. She's a former Minister for International Development and State Ownership Steering in Finland. And in 2017, and that makes it very interesting to have this discussion with you, um, Heidi established a working group on responsible business conduct in their European Parliament. So human rights and sustainability have always been at the core of um, your political work. So great welcome to you, um, Heidi. Um, I would also like to introduce to you Laurent Frex. He is, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Frex, ou Fre, whatever, Frex, okay, <laughs> you will tell us. <laughs> and now I don't hear you. Sorry, I said Frex is perfect. Thank you. Um, very good. Thank you very much, Laurent. So Laurent Frex, um, who is French, he is executive vice president of Nestlé. Um, and uh, Laurent too has been at Nestlé for many years, since 1986, and uh, at every possible different uh, function, which really is uh, gives his very, very rich experience. Uh, since 2008, Laurent has been uh, executive vice president uh, with responsibilities for different regions, a CEO for Europe first, then for the Americas, and now most recently following a reorganization, a geographical reorganization of uh, the Nestle Group, he is um, CEO for Latin America. So great welcome to you, Laurent uh, Frex. And I would also like to welcome very cordially Dan Tepesche. Um, the, let me say that our UN guiding principles um, uh, um, so, uh, perspective in this panel. 
uh, Dante is Chilean and she has been the chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Uh, Dante is um, now doing a lot of academic and also practical work on business and human rights. Um, a great friend of um, the business and human rights community and also especially with a special focus on practical implementation and helping companies. So very great welcome to you Dante Peche at this uh, panel. Um, I will start um, by saying, well, this is a global conference, uh, but about a regional instrument. So my first question goes to Heidi. Um, um, I will put it, um, and you forgive me for being a bit provocative, but that makes the discussion more interesting. I will put it that way. We recently had um, analysis by the International Labour Organization about potential uh, gaps in supply chains and um, in the uh, decent work in supply chains. And one of the key results of this analysis was actually that on the regulatory level, there are no gaps because the regulations are in place, but the big gaps and the deficits are in the implementation, in the application of the rules that are in place. And this was actually also put on the Q&A section by our Bangladesh colleague, Farouk Ahmed, if you go uh, look at the Q&A section, who confirms this, that the deficits are about implementation. So my question to you, um, Heidi, is if, if you agree with this analysis, um, why does the EU then propose or um, another layer of regulation if we already have enough regulation and the real challenge is with implementation. Heidi. <laughs> Thank you, Renate. And um, uh, yes, uh, that's a very good provocation. And my answer would be that um, I don't quite agree. Um, I think that um, um, even uh, the front running companies uh, in responsible business conduct know that um, years and years of voluntary certification and different kind of um, uh, mechanisms uh, that are not mandatory and do not um, create the level playing field actually are not sufficient uh, because still there are lots of uh, uh, free riders in the competition which reap the benefits of, um, of not having uh, the obligations to um, screen their supply chains and value chains. Uh, of any um, uh, environmental damage, human rights violations, etc. So um, I definitely think that um, the EU now uh, has taken a very interesting position by starting to uh, implement the UN guiding principles um, uh, of business and human rights, not, uh, not just the, the, the uh, voluntary part, but also the mandatory part. And let, let us remember that the UN guiding principles are very clear that we need the smart mix. And of course, my, my great mentor and, and, and teacher in this has been Professor Ruggie, who always came to us to say that, look, now it's time for you to, to introduce the, the, the mandatory part. So um, what the EU is now doing, and I, I guess you wanted to hear about the, the, the new proposal. Shall I go on or would, would we keep this more interactive? No, I think uh, it would be good by way of introduction mm -hmm. if you go on about the draft directive. Okay, yeah, okay thanks. Yeah, so indeed, um, uh, this um, work that uh, saw the daylight from the European Commission on the 23rd of February this year um, has a long uh, preparation. Uh, and the long preparation includes uh, very, very uh, large uh, consultations with different stakeholders lots of multi-stakeholder processes, uh, interactions, conferences, webinars, and only an initiative proposal from the European Parliament to guide the Commission. So um, I think um, a lot of uh, things have been clarified. And um, I would say that we who have been working um, uh, on this proposal were quite uh, satisfied. But um, after the first um, look, we discovered that perhaps not everything is, is uh, settled. And if you compare the Commission's proposal with the, the, the international standards, the UN guiding principles, and with the corresponding OECD guidelines, it's, it's, it's plain that there are things that we need to change. And that is what I believe that, that is now going to happen when the European Parliament and the 27 member states uh, are starting to discuss the proposal. And I trust on, on this type of uh, uh, interactions like we have today. So first of all, um, 
a, a couple of good things in the proposal is that um, after all, it does uh, touch the whole value chain of the company, uh, which is great because, uh, you know, just to do it like I understand the German national proposal, uh, it's not enough to look at tier one, perhaps tier two um, of uh, the company, because sometimes the real big issues on, say, forced labor or deforestation, they are at the very, very root of, uh, of the, the value and supply chain. Uh, also, I think um, that um, it's, it's extremely welcome that the Commission uh, creates a, a real possibility for access to justice uh, for victims of, of, uh, of uh, companies, that there is a, a real um, civil liability, which ensures that companies can be held liable for harm and victims will be, will be getting compensation for damages. Uh, which result from the failure to comply with the due diligence obligations, even if the harm has taken place in a non-EU country. And we see that, by the way, that the first uh, court cases, um, uh, which actually highlight this uh, very much, um, um, I, don't, I don't think it still um, reached its final stage, but we had this uh, class action by 17,000 citizens uh, representing by Dutch uh, Greenpeace, uh, who went to court against the Shell, Royal Dutch Shell. And, and the, the Dutch court said that um, uh, the Royal Dutch Shell did not uh, fulfill its, uh, its uh, duty to, um, to manage its, um, its carbon dioxide emissions. And this also in comprising uh, the, um, the emissions in its uh, subsidiaries in, in Nigeria. Uh, and there was a direct reference to, to UN guiding principles in this ruling. So we will see how this develops. But, but I, I'm pretty sure that companies feel that there will be more and more cases like this where they will be held accountable. So it's very useful and important that the EU now creates this kind of uh, possibility that, uh, that victims can, can get uh, access to justice. Uh, there may be some uh, issues to touch here. The burden of proof uh, is on the victim, which I think could be reversed. Um, uh, on, on financial sector, um, the obligations uh, proposed by the Commission are quite limited. Um, and uh, I would like to refer to, to Mrs. Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, who has called for comprehensive due diligence requirements also for the finance sector. So this is something that needs to be done. Um, uh, and, and maybe two more important shortcomings, in my view. Um, there is this uh, concept of um, established business relationships. The extent of due diligence obligations in these proposals um, um, are limited to established business relationships. And this seems to be creating a loophole that indeed it would not um, 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 facilitate uh, the company's look into, into the uh, negative impacts that it has um, in its value chain. And uh, this might very much risk um, to, to lead into a kind of a tick the box exercise, which everybody has always declared should be avoided. So this needs to be looked at. Um, and one more issue I, I want to mention is uh, the um, uh, scope of uh, the companies addressed by this proposal. Um, this is um, only addressing very large companies and um, then um, three sectors of large companies uh, from the mining, textiles and agriculture, forestry sectors. Um, this could be enlarged indeed. Uh, and then uh, the big question on SMEs, which has become quite a, sort of a stumbling block in, 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 in the discussions. Um, a lot of SMEs are now actually realizing that they are part of, um, of a long value chain of bigger company and they feel that they might, uh, they might suffer if, if they are not in the scope of, of this regulation. Uh, so um, on one hand, uh, we have this situation where, where some SMEs feel that they are not uh, entitled to do their due diligence obligations. But on the other hand, we see more and more uh, small and uh, medium-sized companies that, that feel that their competitiveness actually requires to be included in this proposal. So I, I, I think I will leave it to that. And I'm very interested to hear from, um, from um, the other speakers, Laurent Fretze and Dante Pesque on, on how they view, view uh, the, the possibilities of, of putting in place at the European level this mandatory legislation.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. This was a very, very um, to the point and important introduction you gave us, uh, raising all the important points the EU draft um, directive is addressing. So my, my next question, just following on to what you said, um, goes to Laurent uh, from the business perspective, because you will be one of the guys or the people who will have to implement such a directive once it is transposed. Even, even if Switzerland theoretically would not transpose it, but of course Switzerland will also apply it uh, due to the rules uh, and the agreements they have with the EU. But it also this directive will also apply to third country um, businesses. But my question to you is uh, now, especially on this one issue Heidi mentioned, the introduction of a civil liability for the supply chain. That means grievances uh, of people happening in a company which happens to deliver products for you because you have a, a commercial relationship with them could be addressed to you. Now, um, I just wanted to um, say there is a very recent study which an, uh, an analysis which has been made by the Economic Institute of Kiel, the World Economy Institute of Kiel, um, looking at the German legislation on uh, supply chain due diligence, which has just been uh, adopted recently and which will have to be applied from next year onwards. And uh, the result of this analysis says that companies will be actually faced with increased costs and increased risks due to this civil liability, a certain civil liability which is being introduced in the German legislation, much, much, much smaller than what is foreseen in the draft EU directive. But this will potentially um, lead to a situation where companies reduce the number of suppliers, especially from companies uh, from countries with a difficult record or uh, of, of human rights. Um, uh, um, uh, the human rights situation. So um, how would you, from a company perspective, look at this civil liability, which is uh, contained in the draft directive, which is quite strong and all along the supply chain? Laurent, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Renata. Thanks for having me on such an important topic. And maybe allow me to uh, set the scene describing the magnitude of, uh, of the challenge for us. Uh, but I would like to be clear upfront that uh, we, we, we support uh, absolutely the, the new directive for reasons that I will explain and despite the liabilities. Uh, so everyone knows probably Nestle, but uh, possibly not everyone knows that uh, Nestle is the largest consumer goods company in the world and the largest food and beverage company in the world. Uh, we are uh, European, we are global, but we are European, European based, and uh, we uh, have uh, deep uh, European roots and, and values. And we believe that uh, what we do and the way we do it equally matter. It's not just about the what, it's also about the, the how. Um, we are the first buyer of coffee and uh, cocoa uh, in the world. Uh, but, but more broadly, just to uh, frame the magnitude of, of our impact, uh, we, we spend more than 55 billion euros in raw and packaging materials and in services and indirect material. And to your question on uh, restricting uh, our footprint today, we buy directly established business relationship from 150,000 suppliers in 177 countries. So that, that's the, 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 the breadth. Uh, and that's the complexity uh, of our supply chain. And we have no intention to uh, walk away uh, because we believe that uh, it's a real strength to have deep uh, roots uh, globally and, and locally. And anyway, uh, we, we need to procure uh, coffee and cocoa for, from pro producing origins. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, human rights are at the core of our culture, values, and sustainability agenda, and we believe that they are critical to uh, our shared uh, future. 
it's a matter of how we treat our colleagues uh, first, of course, uh, but it's also the view that uh, by respecting and advancing our values and principles across our entire value chain, we are building a foundation that contributes to uh, a better uh, future uh, for our planet and for its people, including the use. Uh, we are putting a specific emphasis on the use that's half of the world uh, population. So there are a number of systemic issues, which I will not detail, of course. Um, inequality uh, is prevailing. Uh, it's more and more visible and, and less and less acceptable, of course. Uh, labor force uh, contains also uh, its issues and inequalities. And we, we tend to forget uh, from the European perspective that uh, in most countries, and this is a big source of inequality, the pre prevailing form of employment is informal. Informality is prevailing. And someone informal without a contract doesn't have protection and, uh, and is not fully integrated into the community. So it's, it's really critical. Uh, to uh, fight uh, that. Uh, and, and of course, we, we are very conscious that uh, increasingly uh, communities uh, and, and consumers are looking at the business uh, to demonstrate uh, what we are doing, what is our impact, uh, and how do we respect uh, our, our values and, and principles. So the way we are framing it, because there are many dimensions, of course, there is uh, the human rights, uh, dimension, but there is also climate change uh, and sustainability. And uh, we want to have a holistic approach to, to, to all those uh, systemic issues. And what we want to do, um, and that connects, of course, to our supply chain, is uh, to accelerate the transformation and the transition to a regenerative food system. Everyone understands, and uh, in, including more in the current context, uh, the issue of food security. And we believe that uh, this is of uh, the essence uh, to help protect and restore the environment. As the, at the same time, we uh, improve the uh, livelihoods of farmers uh, uh, while enhancing the well being of uh, farming communities. So we want this to happen. We want it to be just and equitable, and that requires a number of efforts. What we want to do, uh, talking about farmers, we work with 6 million farmers uh, indirectly, directly or indirectly, actually directly 10% of that. So that relates to what MEP Otala was, was saying. We only have established business relationship with, with, with half of them, uh, with 10% of them, sorry, uh, and a big number uh, are not uh, covered by uh, the directive in this respect, but it's not because they're not covered that uh, we uh, don't uh, care uh, for them. Uh, so on top of, of this, of course, we have launched our net zero roadmap uh, to uh, 2050 and are taking action. And, uh, and, and people are the core of our regeneration uh, promise. Uh, we launched also last year our human rights framework and roadmap, so we have not waited for the directive. And as a matter of fact, it's already 10 years ago that we launched our human rights due diligence uh, program and that uh, we established the principle of uh, uh, living wage uh, across, uh, across our, our employment base. We have also included human rights into uh, 22 corporate standards and policies. We have mainstream human rights at all levels of our governance structure, the board of directors, the executive board. We have strengthened the audits we performed across all the sites we operate in the world and we operate in virtually every country in the world. And we have also developed a grievance mechanism, speak up that allows not only employees, but also uh, external stakeholders to raise complaints. That's uh, very helpful, helps us uh, be uh, a better company uh, if uh, any uh, issue is uh, highlighted. Of course, we investigate and we take action. Uh, but beyond that, we uh, have also implemented uh, uh, some innovative due diligence system. This is where I come to the uh, the farmer's point, uh, like the child labor monitoring and remediation system in our cocoa supply chain that we believe is setting a new uh, standards for the industry. 
So uh, lots of progress, uh, lots of things uh, happening, uh, but certainly uh, lots of uh, challenges going forward. And, and in, in, in that context, this is uh, why we, we, we support uh, fully the development of the EU directive. We welcome its publication. We believe that uh, it creates a level playing field. It brings focus and critical mass. It, and, and in this respect, it brings efficiency and effectiveness. We can complain uh, or some can complain about the costs related to it. I do believe that for the system, there is less cost in the fact that uh, we got a unified uh, directive. And, and the good thing is that um, uh, this, uh, uh, of course, uh, is uh, aligned to, and it's been said, uh, to the international standards set by the UN, set by the OECD, and uh, it will avoid uh, the proliferation of uh, local legislation. So in itself, by design and by essence, it is efficient uh, and effective. It will be. Uh, now, uh, we believe as well that uh, it's been said, uh, the scope uh, possibly creates a loophole uh, in, the, in the framework, uh, this concept of established business relationship uh, uh, may be missing the point. Uh, we believe that uh, some issues or most issues actually could be uh, down tier two, tier three uh, suppliers and especially uh, at, uh, at farming, at farmers' levels. And this is why we, on our side, uh, we uh, uh, want to go uh, above and beyond uh, the directive. We believe that it's important to have an impact on the ground and address the issues uh, where they are, and they may be uh, way beyond the uh, established uh, business uh, relationship. Maybe one example, if you allow me, or just one example additional, we have uh, uh, in this, um, um, cocoa supply chain, where is prevailing the issue of child labor. Uh, those are uh, most of the time poor countries with poor infrastructures. And of course, the issue is linked to poverty and, and, and the quality or the lack of infrastructure. And, um, and earlier this year, we announced a new plan to, uh, to tackle this. And, um, and, and the way we approach it uh, is with the aim to improve the livelihoods of the cocoa farming families, while also advancing these uh, regenerative agricultural practices, uh, but also the point of gender equality. So it is, it is a holistic, truly holistic approach. We provide cash incentives to cocoa farming households for certain activities, such as enrollment of children in school and uh, agroforestry uh, activities that support uh, uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability, of course. And, um, and, and that plans to uh, support uh, our efforts to achieve full traceability and segregation of our cocoa. So we believe that this is with that depth that we can really address uh, the critical issues. Uh, we will invest 1.3 billion by uh, 2030, triple our effort, but uh, we believe that this is what it takes to uh, raise the level and eradicate uh, child uh, labor. So in a nutshell, uh, it, we support uh, the directive, uh, maybe it could be strengthened or clarified uh, in, in some aspects. Uh, we believe that it creates a level playing field. And when it comes to liabilities, of course, uh, like a, a, every regulation, there are li liabilities, but uh, we believe that the positive uh, by far uh, outstrip the potential negative. So we are on board and uh, and we want to make an impact in this respect. Thank, thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, this is uh, very impressive. But of course, since you yourself said you are the largest company worldwide in, in your sector, you have been working at this for many, many years. So I guess um, the European uh, Commission uh, has also been looking at the practices of uh, such pioneers as uh, Nestle for um, looking at its directive. But of course, we have to also make sure that it is applicable and practicable for smaller companies companies which may not be dominating the market in, in the same way as, as you do. But did I get you right? So you said you have 150,000 tier one suppliers. Was that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Ah, so Absolutely. that's really... And they, and they uh, employ millions of people and exactly. those are operating in 177 Seven. countries in the world. 
177 countries. That's a very, very impressive record. Thank you very much for this uh, very impressive presentation. Now, let me come to Dante. Um, you bring in the, how shall I say, the extra European perspective and also the UN guiding principles perspective. So um, when I look at the directive, I see two differences to the UN guiding principles. Um, the one is that in the guiding principles, you have the three pillars, the state duty to protect and the corporate duty to respect, and then the third pillar on the remedy. But in the draft directive, and maybe Heidi can say a word afterwards, one of the recitals says is there is a corporate duty to protect, which in the guiding principles is reserved for the states. I think it, that there's a certain contradiction I detect here. Um, how do you see that from the uh, UN guiding principles perspective? And the other point also where I see a certain difference is that due diligence in the, according to the United, uh, UN guiding principles do not shift responsibilities from the entity causing an adverse human rights impact to the enterprise with, with which it has a business relationship. But in the draft directive, I have the impression that this, this very important distinction is given up. So um, maybe Dante, you can comment on these two elements uh, on possible effects and maybe then also Heidi for a, um, a concluding comment on these two aspects regarding the EU directive and how it interlinks with the guiding principles. So Dante, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Renate. Uh, I would like to add an, one element to your question, which is the other end of the chain, uh, because how I see the world from an exported oriented country is from the beginning or the upstream of the chain uh, and the practical implementation of the directive will have a direct impact uh, in our most, uh, let's say, advanced industries. If I look at the emerging economies and the overall global south. So few, few comments. Um, one, uh, best pu public policy is the one that is best implemented with effectiveness. So the, the discussion, I would like it to be focused on implementation with effectiveness. That's the first uh, comment to make. Uh, when we evaluated, I'm not longer a member of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, but when we evaluated the first 10 years, a few gains. One, business and human rights is already on the agenda and is not contested. That's a net gain. Um, the, uh, we have been building a coalition of the willing within a bubble of strong believers in this agenda, but nevertheless, with consensus on the, let's say the framework and the way forward. And that is very important. Uh, then on due diligence, there's a general acceptance has been mentioned before, ILO, OECD, guiding principles, due diligence as the entry point to understand impacts and to deal with them responsibly um, and preventatively. Uh, and the due diligence uh, element is part of the smart mix, was mentioned before, that's part of the guiding principles. And we're moving from mostly volunteer, voluntary or carrot area to uh, or soft law into more uh, stick uh, arena and hard law, mostly in Western Europe, almost zero of that shift in the rest of the world, well, beyond G7 countries, let's say. Um, uh, so then we have a gap there, and the gap is actually expanding, not shrinking. And uh, you are running far away, and the rest of the world where I stand is not really catching up on the same on the same level. So that raises a, a number of questions about, let's say, or, of risks. The other thing is that uh, due diligence needs to be normalized. We are on that way. Needs, it's an opportunity to challenge, uh, to channel leverage, uh, requires an engagement with affected stakeholders. And so far the compensation has been on stakeholders. And the point that I'm trying to make is stakeholders in general is not exactly the same that affected stakeholders, the ones that are likely to be negatively impacted um, by business decisions. Uh, the other thing where there is certain level of inconsistency, and you mentioned it already, Renate, is that the guiding principles talk about uh, impacts, impact by impact, and not tier by tier, uh, and prioritizing them by severity. So there's room there for improvement in how, uh, let's say, the directive is being framed, but also the other um, legislation in France, Germany, and Norway are being presented. And, and, then, um, and then finally, pillar three, 
very often gets a little bit, let's say, push at the very end uh, and sometimes missed in translation. It's an integral part of due diligence is access to remedy. When government obligations and business responsibilities fail, you move into the remedy pillar. And, and that is something that uh, should be stressed and what well, I have said many times in my previous position, and I keep saying it now, is the reality check. When things fail, what happened with real people? Uh, so I'm not challenging the good intentions. They are there. The pioneers exist. But when things don't go well or go wrong, what happens? So the second point that I want to, to raise is participation in the development of the directive. There was clear participation in the context of Europe with multi-stakeholder, let's say, dialogue, but limited participation from the rest of the world that is going to be directly, for good or bad, impacted by the implementation of the directive, especially affected stakeholders. I'm thinking in the 4 million or 6 million uh, agriculture suppliers to Loran at Nestle, uh, how their perspective and their vision and their views are being considered, integrated, taken into account. Um, and there, there is room there for improvement and we're not late in making that engagement happen. Um, the other thing is that uh, there is a risk that you mentioned it already, Renate, from pushing responsibilities to your first tier contractors uh, and then somehow wash your hands and you're protected and you're, uh, and, and that is, let's say a wrong interpretation. And I will say is, is a, a little bit tricking the system or the spirit of the legislation or the directive. Uh, but we need to take that into account. And I think there was not enough attention uh, being uh, put into the unintended or potential unintended negative consequences of the risking, for example, that has been mentioned before, pulling out from regions, from countries, from sectors, from SMEs, because that raises or, or protects the brand better in terms of their exposure. And that can be an unintended negative consequence. I think we are still on time to go through those unintended negative consequences and, and let's say, and anticipate them and, and deal with them in, let's say, in the legislation or with the companion measures. Uh, finally, looking forward, where are the opportunities? Um, the opportunities are, are a number of them. Some of them are already mentioned in the next 10 years of the, of the guiding principles implementation, but we need to build a global narrative, not only a European narrative, that this is the way forward and these are the benefits. And I will say stressing the business case in combination with the moral obligations. As the high commissioner have stated before, doing the right thing is the smart thing to do. And that should be the narrative, not to put in a defensive mode, our exporters, my exporters, but put them in a positive mode to say, this is an opportunity to enhance competitiveness, to better access and retain markets, to better access and attract good quality investors through trade and commerce. As WTO uh, uh, Deputy General Secretary has just stressed, that's how things reach us and impact us. So we need a global narrative in positive terms. We need to build a global coalition of the willing. Um, and I will say with a need to engage in political dialogue with G7, of course, but also G20. And, and of course, the, all, I will say without China in this conversation or without India in this conversation or without the big economic players of the world, I think we will be missing a golden opportunity to raise the bar and level the playing field for many beyond uh, Europe. And then finally, we need to build the infrastructure for implementation, the infrastructure to support the implementation in Europe, out of Europe. Help desk, for example, work with the local players that have local representation, let's say the industry associations, because they are local and the impacts will happen locally for good, Let's say we, this will drive improvement, but also for bad if we don't tackle the unintended negative uh, consequences, including a very important element of knowledge management. And I will say that the, Europe, the directive will follow its, uh, let's say, its, uh, its route, will be improved with the better consistency with the international standards. But in the meantime, we can learn from France, we can learn from Norway, and we can learn from Germany on the practicalities and integrate those lessons as soon as possible into the framework of the directive, but also on the companying measures that in my view have to be, hand in, be developed hand in hand 
Otherwise, as I said, we might lose a golden opportunity to really push this agenda on, on speed and scale. Thank you, Renate. Thank you very much, Dante. And now the last word goes to Heidi, because I think this is uh, quite interesting. So what are your reactions to this? And how can the EU directive avoid the unintended consequence of uh, pushing companies uh, to uh, um, cut and run instead of to improve the situation or contribute to improving to the situation in the countries where there are problems, because that's definitely one of the risks. And how do you intend, uh, because you you are, have all the experience also in the context with Southeast Asia, with uh, um, uh, the other parts of the world from the International uh, Com Trade Committee, how do you think this um, can become a kind of a global story and a global um, level playing field? Heidi, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think um, um, the Nestle experience with this cocoa supply chain is, uh, is a very good example. Uh, and I've, I've had a pleasure to and privilege to sort of be involved from the European Parliament side. So um, this, this idea that I also think we heard from ILO today in the earlier panel, that it's, it's really necessary to bring all the stakeholders around the table. Uh, including uh, the producer countries, because we don't want just this sort of European affluent country uh, cleansing of our conscience. This is not the point. The point is to have an impact on the ground, to eradicate the, the adverse impacts. And then I believe that um, uh, what now is uh, being um, debated uh, between the, the, the chocolate producing companies such as Nestle, uh, the European uh, institutions, uh, civil society in Europe, uh, which is a big consumer, uh, in Africa, and with the two governments of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. I think this could be a, a bit of a model for others, because then we also see that um, the producing countries are troubled and worried about what's, what's going to happen. And um, uh, the, the OECD countries have uh, a lot of possibilities to come and help with development cooperation tools, uh, capacity building, uh, and uh, so we cannot expect uh, companies to, to bring all the children to school in Africa. You know? We really need the governments and, and the, the development community to be involved. Um, uh, so um, this really, I think, has to be the, the way forward. And I'm, I'm very eager to see that we also um, discuss these issues with the, with the trade partner countries. Um, um, I'm, I'm working at the moment in the European Parliament on the generalized system of preferences, GSP, which uh, is aimed at uh, improving the lives of uh, 2 billion people on this earth. And I think it would be very useful to sort of um, uh, to um, have our, our beneficiary countries also to take a look at the, the UN guiding principles. And um, I would very much want to see that, uh, that we would invite them to, to, to put in place a national action plan on business and human rights. Some of them have done it, for instance, Pakistan. And um, it could be a great tool if used. Uh, and then finally, perhaps uh, on, uh, on the um, uh, deviation from international standards. We know, of course, that there were many contra contradictory interests uh, playing when the European Commission gave its proposal. It's, it's quite a sort of colorful story, in fact. But um, um, I think Dante has mentioned um, one more uh, deviation, which is this contract-based due diligence. Uh, and I think um, we cannot rely on that. So um, I, I, I would very much count on, 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 on the support from the, the, the sort of progressive companies such as Nestle and, of course, the, the UN uh, a working group on business and human rights and others, so that we can together again in a broad consultation to 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 carry out the necessary improvements. So I'm looking forward to, to working with yourselves to continue to work with you. And um, so uh, this is an important milestone on the way, but we are not there yet. And uh, indeed, uh, we couldn't uh, we shouldn't forget that this is meant to improve the situation of our people and the planet on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. This was a very, very good concluding word. I think the main point is what also Marta said in the last panel, 
The main difference is what happens on the ground, not what is in the textbooks, finally. So it has to be operational and it has to be accepted and applicable around the world. And we really look forward to working with you on to making this a success for all companies and also for the countries around the globe, because quite rightly, um, I see a comment on the chat, the Global South is usually overlooked in our conferences, and I think it is important not to do so, because if we want to have um, good relations and to develop and to improve the situations, we have to take into account these perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Laurent. And thank you, Dante, for these very, very interesting insights. And I would like to conclude the panel here and say goodbye and au revoir rather than goodbye. So looking forward to staying in touch with you. And I would now like to hand over right away. And, and adios. Yes, and adios, adios. Adios, um, <laughs> adios amigo. <laughs> Thank you very much, Renate, for facilitating this very interesting panel. I think we've seen a, a true 360 stakeholder discussion about the new EU directive. And now we come to the next round where I would like to ask our four panelists already to join me on stage, Matthias, Elko, Lillian and Thorsten. Um, just come up here and take your seat. And while you're finding your seat, I would like to hand over to Gabriela Rick Herzog, um, who will set the scene for the next panel. Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Greetings to everyone from uh, here in New Jersey in the United States. And congratulations again to the organizers, IOE, BDA, and Deutsche Post DHL for this very important conference. In this next panel, um, we'll be talking um, about um, companies' engagement in human rights. And I just would point out that over the past decade, the private sector has been making huge efforts and has adapted successfully to implementing and respecting human rights. Some are going even further with implementation measures that go beyond the UNGP's framework and provide greater protection against possible human rights harm. This proactive initiative is however, um, sometimes hampered by elements that can be outside of a company's reach, in particular governance gaps and national level uh, context. Collaboration among governments, peers and stakeholders is therefore critical to achieving positive, sustainable and long lasting change. We look forward to hearing more about these private sector initiatives in this panel. And with pleasure, I turn it over to IOE's Deputy Secretary General, Matthias Thorns. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela, for setting the scene. That's great. And indeed, we have heard the afternoon from different UN organizations, from the High Commissioner, from the ILO, from the WTO, from the um, EU Parliament, from the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And now it's really time to listen to business because the companies we're having here on the panel and which are joining online have a long journey already behind them, a long journey to implement the UN guiding principles, a long, long journey to promote business and human rights. This is also GRI. GRI is of course not a company, but 11,000 companies reporting according to GRI standards. So there's also huge, huge knowledge when it comes to what our companies are doing. In this panel, we want to know what they are doing, what are the lessons learned from the last 10 years and plus in their journey, what are the challenges, and where are opportunities to even go further in the implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. With us is Lilian Ung from Deutsche Post DHL. We heard already a bit about Deutsche Post DHL journey on business and human rights, but she will go much deeper. With us is Elko van der Enden, which, who is the um, CEO of GI, the Global Reporting Initiative. This is Paulali Online, who is the VP for Human Rights at the Coca-Cola Company. We have Gisela Eikhoff also joining online. She is responsible for human rights sustainability in Harting, which is a Mittelständler, a German medium-sized company. And at least, last not but least, sorry, Thorsten Pinkepang from BASF. So with that, I directly would like to go into the discussion and see from you, Lilian, whether you can elaborate a bit further about the DHL journey on business and human rights and where do you see challenges as well as opportunities actually to go further. 
over to you. Okay. Um, so I think if we look at, you know, the journey that we have gone through as DHL, it's been, you know, we've begun with setting up the frameworks. That means, you know, we started looking at what policies and policy statements do we have to have in place and what do we need to adapt due to the changes that we're seeing, you know, coming from the governments, be it the EU, EU directive or even the different supply chain laws that are coming into play in different countries. And so what we did over a few years ago was, you know, set up a human rights policy statement that was as up to date as it can be given the current speed of change that we have um, with the legislation. But then from there, we took it and we started adapting all the other dependent policies on it. What do we mean by that? Of course, we're looking at the supply chain, um, the supplier code of conduct, then also looking at the code of conduct itself. And it's set up, let's say, you know, this whole wheel of changing in policies and making sure that they're all kind of talking to each other because the challenge of that is in companies as big as ours, we're talking about 590,000 employees, you know, present in around about 220 countries. What does that mean? getting all of that connected into one big picture can be a challenge in itself. And I think that that's where we started our journey with. And the second phase that we went into was actually then cascading this network of policies and rules that we put into place into the organization. Also there, the complexity is, how do you make sure that it's not just, let's say, the headquarter folks that know about it, but every single country and every single division in the local countries that they are aware of it and also comply exactly to the same standard. And you know what we did was, you know, it ranges from putting together a large, you know, training setup for this, which was also mandatory to our managers, not only to the senior executive team, but also to the middle management. When we in DPDHL talk about senior executive team and middle management, some companies talk about a few hundred folks. We're talking already in the thousands. So that means every single country head needs to go through the training, adding also consequence management to it to make sure that people actually not only think they're doing the training, but we're gonna be checking on that. And then, you know, going into how do we cascade this to our blue collar operations so that they actually know what their rights are. So that means for us, we're looking at, you know, more than 52 um, translations that we're going to have to do, communication campaigns in those warehouses, et cetera. And that in itself takes a phase, takes quite some time. And lastly, you know, beyond just setting up the framework and cascading this information down, you know, the entire organization, I look at the part of enablement. That means, you know, how do, do our countries actually, how do we enable them to do their own self checks? Because we in the headquarters cannot be in every single country and every single warehouse and check that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that means, you know, enabling tools so that they can self assess, but also tools that help them solve the problems as well. You know, putting those things into play and the second part, which is actually providing teams. So if you look at how many auditing days we had, we had during um, the last year, you know, around about 200 audit days where we went into the countries, interviewed around about 800 employees worldwide, you know, conducted more than 140 um, local focus groups to make sure, you know, that those human rights messages are really um, getting a grip in the countries, but also ensuring that we are able to report on it and have a good feeling that everything is really coming into play as we wish. So that's a little bit our journey on how we started and where we are right now. Thank you so much. And indeed, having 50 languages translated your human rights statement is really impressive. And I know that how challenging it's actually just to have the translation and then to making sure that they're hanging in every warehouse. That is really something alone speaking about that. Unfortunately, our iPad died here. So I would really appreciate if someone could ask, send me the questions on my WhatsApp. That would be really helpful so we can make it interactive and I can make sure that the audience can ask questions to you. Where, you know, during I get the questions on my WhatsApp, I would directly go to you, um, Enko. What are the experience with? Ah, there they are. Excellent. Now I would need my glasses. And, but going forward, is in, <laughs> but what I see is thank you. Thank you is always a good start. Yeah, thank you very much. It's always a good start. So thank you. Um, Echo, when we waiting for more questions directly coming to you and when it comes to the um, GI experience, because as I said, 11,000 companies are reporting according to GI. This is a huge mass and you have a lot of knowledge what is going on what companies are doing, where are the challenges still, and where you think are the achievements. 
Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> let, let, let me start that we uh, just renewed our universal standards and part of them is now, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the, the human rights principles out of the United Nations that have been truly embedded. So it's no longer a choice to pick that out as a topic specific thing to report on. Now it's just integrated. You have to take these on board and otherwise you're not GRI compliant. But I would say, thank God, uh, all the organizations that indeed do report under GRI, nearly 11,000, they already take human rights into consideration. And what do we see happening of, of, of lately? It's quite interesting. Uh, and I, I, I only joined as CEO January 1st this year. So then you, you start to look in through some information and some data. And it appeared that in 2021, uh, our standards free for all, they're free, uh, uh, free, free good. And they were downloaded 783,183 times. Uh, that's on a global scale. And we know per country what's happening there. By far the most had to do with human issues, with human capital issues. That to me, quite frankly, was a surprise. Also, because most questions we got out of the United States were on human capital. Equal pay, diversity, indigenous people, and so forth and so forth. So there is huge interest by business and other stakeholders in this topic. And why do I think that is important? When it comes to business, we all know that human capital, human resources are crucial for our organization. And if we would not think altruistic, what we always have to do, of course, then you know that this is a quite important element of being able to produce, be successful and create value. On the other hand, if as a business you are not seen as a fair and good uh, employer, if you do not take the needs of, of people and society seriously, it will be very difficult for you to indeed attract the talent. We live in de uh, demographic uh, challenging times. Uh, we have an aging, uh, aging population. It's difficult to attract younger people in various, uh, various, uh, in various regions and, uh, and, and countries. So therefore showing your responsible employer uh, uh, image and face is important. And what we see with, with, with organizations, when we get questions for support, how do, how do other people uh, do that? What are they doing? Benchmarking is quite different. The fact that where some organizations struggle with is how to get across all the good things they do on behalf of, of, of human topics in such a way that people see that they mean and that they try to make good on the promises they make to society in this respect. And that's where, of course, GRI stops in. We, we offer a, call it a platform for information that will lead to impactful debate on, in this case, a, a social impact that is based on facts and not on perception. Then the second question we get, and that's exactly basically what you, uh, what you were referring to, how the hell are we going to implement this and monitor and test that the policies we have are indeed being followed? Because the interesting part, this has not only to do with, let's call it the internal value creative elements of reporting at the level of, of, of your organization. No, this is also, when it comes to GRI, on the impacts you have on environment and on socioeconomic cohesion. So it is more an inside out. How do I audit? How do I monitor? How do I control, indeed, these external factors, which may be new, and then I will shut up because then we get to audit and insurance and all that other stuff. But, but those topics are typically the ones, uh, uh, the questions we get. A lot of uptake on, on, on human capital as such, tremendous. Then how are we going to implement this? And then how are we going to monitoring and control that our organization is indeed in control of these external factors? Thank you so much. And I would really encourage everyone who is online to write the questions into the chat. I'm looking also here in the room if there's a question here. I can't see any hands so far. So we have a really here interactive exchange. I would like to go to you to Atlanta, to you, Paul. The Coca-Cola company, of course, has a long journey when it comes to implementing 
um, the UN guiding principles. But you also, since I think 13 years now, have the Engagement Business Forum, which is a forum where you bring in 100, 200, 300 companies speaking about what they're doing with regard to business and human rights. So you have really also these huge experiences when it comes to US companies engaging on this topic. Can you take, give us your takeaways, your key lessons learned in the last 10 years? Sure. Uh, first, Matisse, it's great to see you um, and everyone there. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Uh, thank you, IOE, BBA, and DHL for, for having me on this really important panel. And um, it's interesting, you mentioned our forum. I was just at the last two days uh, working on the, the schedule and format for it. So we're, we're actually very exciting to, assuming things uh, continue as they do now, to be restate, reinstating the, the uh, in-person um, sector of the forum, like we've had in before the last two years, over 200 participants. So yeah, I think it's going to be a, a wonderful opportunity for all of us to get together talk about the last few years and what we have ahead of us. Um, as far as the Coca-Cola company, so just to give a little history of me for perspective, I started, I took over uh, last February. So it's been a little over a year before that I, I ran uh, General Electric's human rights program globally. And it's been a, a fascinating journey over this first year learning the company and our challenges. As Matias said, we have a long um, and strong history in human rights. Um, but I come at an interesting time, I find, and it is what is what led me to, to take on this role, because I think as companies, um, we see a challenge ahead as to what is going to be expected of responsible companies going forward. When you see the heavy push to regulation and hard law in this space, when you see uh, investors becoming more and more sophisticated as to what they're asking about companies when it comes to ESG. Um, we look at uh, we look at these challenges and we say, okay, we have a strong program, we have strong policies, uh, um, an underlying governance program. We at Coke have a, a, a supplier tier one supplier audit program that audits on site twenty over twenty five hundred audits a year on site. Um, but when you look what's ahead. And it is why we are currently in a review of our program uh, that started about six months ago. Um, and part of that is looking at what these expectations will be 10 years down the road in the legal space, in the investor space, in our criticals from our critical stakeholders. And I just could name a few that we're thinking about. Um, so we have a strong storied audit program, but clearly the, the asks now is to go beyond audits. The question is, in addition to your audits, what are you doing to ensure compliance within your supply chain? What are you doing between the audits that take place? What other tools are you using? Are audits the most effective way to ensure compliance? And so that's the, one of the areas that we're analyzing now. Uh, and it's really kind of a relook at a very longstanding program. Um, below tier one is going to be the big push, um, understandably. Um, we, have, we are already touching below tier one supply chain in a number of ways. A couple of examples um, in our, our plastic recycling program, uh, we now have a new due diligence initiative that extends down to the informal, what they call waste collection sector. So these individuals who are informal workers who are actually collecting the plastic then gets put back into the recycled uh, plastic value chain. Um, that's probably one of the most vulnerable working sectors you can think of in a number of these countries. So we're looking at below that to try to extend our social and worker rights due diligence standards to that next stage. It's a very challenging space. Um, we're doing it in our agricultural sector below tier one through what we call our principles for sustainable agriculture. And this extends our, again, our human rights policies down to the farm level. We all have challenges in that when it comes to transparency and mapping. So I think that's going to be a next level challenge for all of us. Uh, when it comes to the regulations, you can see there's a focus, a new focus, not just on upstream, which has been the traditional focus of human rights in the supply chain, but downstream. So downstream due diligence, whether it's the products, uh, whether in our case, that recycling space, um, that's a new area that I think all companies need to step into and understand that's going to be 
an ask of companies to focus on. And one step that we're looking at now is the move from simply do no harm to do good, to have a positive impact where you do business, a positive impact on the workers, a positive impact on the communities. And that takes a whole new host of impact metrics. Um, in my mind, without metrics, you really can't drive meaningful change and measure it and know that you're making progress year to year. So we're historically used to metrics in the do no harm space, number of trainings that occurred, the number of audits that were done, percentage compliance. Uh, now we're looking at a whole new set of metrics that evaluate impact on individuals. Um, and we are, as part of our program review now, we are actually going through an exercise of evaluating potential impact metrics in our supply chain, both tier one and below, um, as well as in the communities where we operate. And I think that's, that is increasingly becoming the ask of companies. Um, again, as it is in all areas of human rights, it is not just the purview or responsibility of business, but it's certainly going to be an increased expectation. And I'd say finally, um, Matthias, one of our big areas of focus is on grievance mechanism, effective grievance mechanisms in this space. I think that's another way that you can both improve your due diligence beyond audits is effective grievance mechanisms. It also helps you measure the impact that you're having, um, as well as evaluate the risk that's occurring throughout the globe. So those are some of the thoughts we're having as we go into the next kind of decade of our program. Thank you, Paul. And I think the whole issue going beyond tier one, measuring the positive impact and having a grievance mechanism, which is impactful, which is easily accessible, are challenges with many, many countries, uh, sorry, companies actually um, share here in the room and here also on the panel. This us on the panel is, as I said, a medium-sized company who is nevertheless engaged on the issue for a long, long time. Gisela Eikhoff from Harting. Harting was very much engaged in the development of ISO 26000 more than 10 years ago. And they are keep on with the journey. So it would be really interesting to hear from a medium-sized companies, how do they engage? What are the big challenges going ahead? And what kind of opportunities they see? Over to you, Gisela. Ilra, are you still there? I see your slide, but not you. Here we are. Ah, perfect. Okay. Excellent. Happy to see you all today. I want to like to start to tell you something about Harting. Harting is a family owned company. And what we do is we have um, a medium sized company, a typical German Mittelstand, we call it. And our products are connectors. And I think maybe it's easy to see. The materials we use, the matrix, these are gold, these are copper and aluminum. And um, you will see, we will talk about this later. I want to focus on the supply chain because here I see a lot of problems we <laughs> are confronted with. Um, these materials play an, an essential role. So when we take a look at our suppliers, we do, I think, what every other company is, is doing as well. We take the principle of relevance and take a look at our more than 5,000 suppliers, you know, medium sized, you have to consider. So we take a risk analysis by country where we look for corruption risk or envi environmental aspects or modern slavery and things like that. And we started a few years ago to take a deeper look at the commodities we buy. So by example, the metals or things like that. And we pair this group of circled with suppliers, with our strategic suppliers, and everybody you're familiar with has to fulfill a self-assessment. And afterwards, we take a look at the results and we say, okay, we have to define measures of improvement and see what will happen in future. And here I would like to name the first challenge we are confronted with. We have a lot of wonderful suppliers and we really appreciate to work together with them. But you have to see most of them are very, very small. Yeah, they have 200, 100 or 500 employees and that's it. So when I talk to my suppliers, I always ask them, what do you do in your supply chain? How do you manage human rights? What is your system? And how do you engage in your supply chain? And an answer I always get is, I know my suppliers or I have no influence. This is typical. 
And then I had another question and ask, do you try it? Do you have ever asked one of your supplier what he really does in his supply chain? And in over 90%, the answer is no, because they do not ask their suppliers. And this is really a problem uh, we see, and this is why we engage and motivate them and say to them, okay, try it, just go for it. Yes, yeah? start with one or two suppliers when you've got uh, only a few. Uh, take one commodity group and analyze it and then go and start to ask the first questions. And normally when you ask questions, you get an answer. This is how it works. It doesn't matter which way to start, but it's real necessary to start. And this is something we underline in every talk and every um, uh, meeting we have. Another aspect is that we do not have any CSR audits. We have quality audits. And what we do is that we um, that I jump in the meetings and stay there for 30, 60 minutes. And we talk about CSR and human rights issues. And normally after three or four minutes of discussion, you know if the partner is reliable or not, if he has an idea about human rights, if he has an idea about measures in his supply chain and so on. And this is a good possibility for me to see, okay, how engaged are our suppliers and where I, can we support them? And this is the second point I want to underline, because knowledge is quite often missing. We all know the guiding principles for human rights and companies, and that's okay. But most of the people I talk to, they do not know this, and they will never read all the papers. So what we need is training, training, training. And this is a huge effort. I did two trainings this week with suppliers, and uh, we have to see maybe IOE or somebody else who can really offer all these trainings for people who need all this knowledge that is necessary. Well, I want to come back to our categories, to our materials we use. And when we take a look at these materials, we started from um, a year ago and take a look at the demand, the supply situation, situation, the future perspective of all these materials and as well as the CSR risk. And I think you are all familiar with the highest risk is at the beginning of our supply chain, not in the, yeah, at the mining process. And then we've got the processing industry, but until the good comes to us, there's a long way, but the highest human is, risk is here. So I think it's necessary that we go step by step through the supply chain and engage and make sure that we get the information. What we did after the analysis was that we talked to our suppliers. We showed them our analysis and we said, okay, what is your impression? What kind of information do you have got? And they said, okay, they told us about their supply chain, which preferred suppliers they've got, where do they come from, where are their recycling sources, yeah, because this is necessary to know, but also two aspects, their needs and their fears. And this is something we have to be aware of. While we see these, um, talks are very, very time consuming, but we are convinced that it's worth every second we spend on because this is a way we can build connections and trust is a basis for us for a partnership. And now I see that the suppliers come back to me and ask questions how to handle things and we can do at the exchange. A network I want to mention because we engage in this network for more than two years is the Human Rights One Table of the automotive industry. Here we've got the possibility to talk to experts from the OEMs as well as suppliers, but also NGO rep representatives or representatives from the government. And yeah, this is crazy because Harding is a small company. Yeah? When we sit there, we're one of the smallest companies there, but I've got the chance to talk to an expert. I've got to, uh, the chance to talk to an expert from the NGO or to a human rights expert from a big OAM. Yeah? That's crazy because normally I do not have the chance. And I think that this network or networks like today, that these are the basis and to improve human rights. And Paul just mentioned, that have an impact on individuals. I think this is the most important one. And we do a lot of paperwork and send self-assessments and things like that. But at the end, we have to see all the efforts we start, do they really have an impact for people? Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Gidra. That was great. And really, you have to start somewhere and you have to then start walking the walk because otherwise you will never walk. Also, the importance of networks, you know, the ability to speak with experts, to speak with NGOs who are in the realm, I think was very important. And the last one is really, once you engage with your suppliers, they start to engage and they come back to you. I think okay. three key insights. Thank you for that. Over to you, Thorsten. BASF is a huge company. You employ, I think, in Germany alone, 50,000, 40,000, something around there, a bit more even, a bit more. So you will say, speak to that in a minute. You are engaged on this journey also for a long time now. What are your key takeaway? I think I have your mic. Yeah, thank you for the micro and thank you for having me here. Yeah, let me maybe start by saying uh, why we do this engagement in terms of human rights and maybe then talking a little bit about the what and when it comes to the what I would I would have three messages, the responsible homework, so to speak, within our operations, then I would like to talk about meaningful stakeholder engagement and maybe what's very important for me or for us I think it's really the collective actions we already heard some of the keywords like multilateralism or, or SMEs for instance so when it comes to the motivation the reason why we have already heard today that there are many extrinsic motivations for sure we see what civil societies NGOs are demanding from us we see what 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 for sure comes from investors thinking about ESG ratings and we've heard a lot of already today about the regulations. And to, to be honest with you, I'm a bit concerned how we as societies are able to align all these upcoming regulations. It's not only about human rights regulations, it's about GRIs with us, uh, reporting regulations, transparency regulations. So to have their uh, aligned approach, this is really a challenge for companies. But it's not only about these extremes, these motivations. We are also in, intrinsically motivated. We, are, we should not forget about the stakeholder of our employees. We want to respect human rights. We want to provide value to society because we are convinced no successful business in unsuccessful societies. So, so that, is, that is the reason why it's not that we are currently being trying to be altruistic or because laws are demanding this from us. We want to provide value to society. So let's talk a little bit about the what. For sure, also BSF is doing all what it needs to be done along the three or four five elements of all the national action plans and, and the UN guiding principles. Our first uh, policy paper was written before the UN guiding principles were established. And that, that was my first touch point with human rights, by the way, a bit more than 10 years ago. For sure, we, we do, do all the things needed in risk analysis. You were talking about audits and certification. I will not dive into that. For sure, we do hundreds of audits. We, we also arranged together for sustainability a collective action platform for chemical industries. For sure, it's about grievance mechanism. That's an important thing. We heard about Danta, I think, say, uh, talking about the direct access, not only via hotlines in many, many languages or web pages, but direct access to grievance mechanisms. BSF somehow not invented, but very early on used the community advisory panels as a, as a gateway to grievances, so to speak. And for sure, reporting is important for us. We, we, we spearheaded the idea of integrated reporting using for sure also GRI, so sitting in the GRI stakeholder council developing G4. That is our long track record and, and that's important and that is what we need to do. But I think the, the really, let's say levers for a company like us, we are the largest chemical company in the world employing a little bit more than 110,000 people. So, so, and we have also approximately between 70 and 80,000 first year supplies. So this is all a challenge for, let's say the operational excellence. But important is that we all understand we cannot and we must not lay the human rights on the shoulders of private sector. We need to have a meaningful stakeholder engagement. And let me give you two examples here. For sure, we engage in the networks like, like UN, Guiding, UN Global Compact. My company was a founding member of the UN Global Compact back in 2000, following Kofi Annan's call in Davos. I, I'm as a chair of the uh, Global Compact German section. So, so that is for sure a level of engagement where we can also not only learn, but also give some insights and also trying to create a, let's say, proper framework for human rights implementation. But we also established two own 
levels and engagement tools. That is a stakeholder advisory council where I said already 10 years back, we need to have an engagement, a constant engagement of our board members and stakeholders. And then that time, 10 years back, there was human rights a part of sustainability. For two years back, uh, now we have engaged also a human rights advisory council where we have, we have, we have people recommending steps for us where we are able to also now discuss very confidential topics and issues we see along the value chain. It's about the value chain. It's not only about the supply chain. We need to we need to think about that. If you look at the European ideas, it will also go downstream. So therefore, we also need to have proper uh, operational models and management systems. That we already screen all our portfolio. This is sixty thousand product application via sustainability criteria. So this is what I also mean with important and 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 let's say a meaningful stakeholder engagement, but. The third thing, collective action, building up alliances. I think this is the most important thing we can do. And so I give you two examples on that. A sector alliance we are currently building up in Germany for the chemical sectors. We have been instrumental to build up a so-called Chemie by three, Chemie hoch drei, uh, alliance between not only our employer association and the industry association, but also the union. So three, these three alliance partners, union, industry association, and employer association now built up this uh, chemistry by three platform. And about two years back, we started to discuss, look, the due diligence consequences we see from coming from regulation wrong human rights we need to have something like a branch standard so currently these three partners are developing a sector standard a branch standard which is then interpreting specifically for smes how how we can how we can cope and how we can implement the regulatory expectations and maybe lately and i, I guess there's a slide on that if it's not working it's not not, not important Okay. Uh, lately, uh, when it comes, it's not only about sector initiatives, I think, which are important, but also value chain initiatives or alliances. And there is a huge demand from sustainability and from sustainable development. Oh, okay, now it goes. Last slide. Yeah, uh, this one here. Uh, batteries. We all know we want to drive electrically. We all need the gadgets like the iPads, sometimes working, <laughs> sometimes not. And all, for all this, we need batteries. So batteries need to power sustainable development. But I guess all are familiar with the issues along the value chain of batteries, thinking about cobalt, thinking about the Democratic Republic of Congo, thinking about different parts of the world. And we discussed in Davos in 17 that we need to come up with an alliance not only private sector, not only government, but also NGOs. And now we have like 100 plus partners from business, from private, from, from governmental and from non-government organizations, trying to establish a whole value chain according to a solution and according to a contribution to sustainable development. And to basic, to basically two things, two, two work streams, a cobalt action partnership, trying to come up with a draft standard for artisanal mining, where the issues are with the child labor. And maybe important, and we heard already the keyword transparency, we are currently building a so-called battery passport. That's a digital twin for each and every battery, currently starting with greenhouse gases and child labor as indicators for that. And these kinds of transparency is a really an implementing of the human guiding principles, so to speak, to, to for human rights. And so and I heard Dante talking about this global narrative. We all are knowing the pink elephant is the room is a war in Ukraine here. And but that does not mean that must not mean that we're trying to get back to nationalization or regionalization. The planet will stay the planet regardless of what we are doing on a political level. And so also the linkages we have to all these regions, we must not cut completely. And that means we need a global narrative. And that means we need like initiatives like this Global Veterinary Alliance because we need to keep it global. The human rights are a global innovation and therefore we need this global narrative and global initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have time indeed for some questions. So I'm looking here into the audience and can you put the questions here on the monitor, please, from the regime? That would be extremely helpful. Any questions in the room? 
the room is completely closed after two days of workshop, they are done with questions. So looking now here, I have to go. You're welcome, perfect. Is it possible to have the names of the speakers? Okay, that's it. Could I just mention, please, shared with us, many things, Rebecca. Okay, there's no question online. Then let me um, ask the question. There is now more and more the um, demand actually to link climate change with human rights, right? And on the one hand, of course, you can argue, sure, we anyway already in looking at our eco um, footprint, our climate change footprint as a company. But it will become challenging when it is about remedy, isn't it, right? Because who is providing remedy when it is about rising temperatures? Who is responsible for that? You know, since climate change, the impact, it comes for a long time already. So how do you do that within companies? Because all of you are more or less uh, have to deal with it, right? The issue about how you engage in the discussion about climate change and human rights. And perhaps, Liliane, I start with you because you are, of course, a logistic company. You will have to deal with that uh, in many ways. And I'm sure you have a lot already thinking about that in the last year or so. Yeah. Um, so if you look at our ESG strategy and what we've been communicating outside in the market, it's mainly been around decarbonization. You can imagine the logistics provider, we have airplanes that are riding out. So quite a few, quite a lot of carbon, um, being, um, carbon dioxide usage there. Then we have, of course, our trucking business and then the shipping. And that's kind of, so all of our environmental targets, you know, we see a lot of the laws coming out with, um, specific chemical products, et cetera, we're looking a lot at decarbonization, right? And so what we've been doing um, along those lines is definitely um, developing also our own technology because part of the problem is, you know, we are trying to um, do a lot, but to a certain extent, green fuel is not as available as we'd like to buy it. So if you look at our planes, we would like to transform our entire fleet. The problem is to a certain extent, we're not getting access to what we need. So it's almost like, the targets of the company have advanced a little bit at a faster pace than what is available in terms of supply of what we can actually do about that, right? Um, and to the, your question about how are we linking that to our human rights part, to be really open with you, if we look at our human rights challenges, they are at the moment at a different area. It's definitely along the supply chain, right? So, you know, in a typical logistics business, we have a lot of third party suppliers, for example, for temp labor, for example, we don't, every single parcel that you're going to be transferring from point A to point B is not going to be with our own in source driver. We will use, for example, third party um, transportation um, 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 companies that will be doing some of this transportation and linking. First of all, our um, um, green targets to those, that's one challenge, but we're keeping it separately, let's say from our employee challenges, where you know, the conditions under which our temp labor will be working, we're not doing that extreme connect as I've seen some other companies doing it. And I guess it's more because we're doubling down on each of the E and the S and the G pillars instead of trying to connect them already. I think we're just not quite there yet. You know, Our main challenge is if we look at the human rights um, trajectory is less about our own employees where we have full visibility, even though we we have 600,000 employees, we have quite a good visibility about where they are, how are they paid, how are they treated locally. The problem is all those other subcos that are coming. So, you know, every other truck driver that's coming to pick up some goods at our warehouse, are those truck drivers being treated as well as they should be treated? And that's where I think we're doubling down on very heavily. So we don't connect it as much as you're currently alluding to. And I think that's probably going to be more the case for other industries where there is a heavier link between those two. Thank you so much. Um, again, you are not a company, but how you link it in the GI standard? I mean, the GI standard is very comprehensive. At the end of the day, you look into issues linked to emissions as you long look to human rights. Do you see the strong interlinkages building? We see it. We see it more and more happening. If you look for a, a right, like a safe, a safe workplace, that is very much linked, of course, to pollution and how you operate and how you, uh, how you have designed your production processes. What we currently also see happening is that many states and jurisdiction start to impose, impose more taxation on, on polluting production capacities, which then will li links again to your tax standard. So what you, a safe workplace 
links to your clean production capacity, links to your uh, uh, the amount of environmental taxes you pay or do not pay. So we have an, something like a joke that we say aggressive tax planning to save the world, because the cleaner you produce, the less environmental taxes you pay, the better the working conditions are for the staff in your factories. And then the better it is, of course, for attracting attracting new staff. So what we try to achieve and, 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 and get over the fence more and more, there is for these topics not one single solution. Everything is interconnected and connected. And coming back to the climate issue, and I had a discussion in, in, uh, with a European uh, commissioner on this. So we have, we have a situation in Ethiopia and in, uh, in Eritrea. There is water, but it all falls in one day instead of in one month. So the topsoil moves away. So that means that the that 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 the herds moving downwards in the valleys. So you get there something like a civil war because they start eating the crops from the farmers, which then leads because there is not sufficient food. People leaving to North Africa to fly to to flee to Europe in order to get a better existence. So with the climate change element of the unpredictable uh, rainfall leading in the end to migration, which is again, of course, a human issue. So you cannot just stop this problem by stopping boats in Africa or, or whatever. You have to come to comprehensive solutions. And that's what I liked so much about your story. You have to see it in a holistic way. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. So human rights is an integrated part of the total solution of the, uh, of the issues we're facing as a planet. You're looking already for the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I had the impression you wanted to ask me too. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, as you said, we need to see it holistically, but uh, we also need to go, go beyond the topic, so to speak. Uh, the battery passport, for, for instance, is a perfect example for the interlinkages of greenhouse gases and child labor. There we need to this kind of transparency to show the interlinkages, to show correlations, and to address them then. Another thing is, so transparency is one thing, connect these dots behind every E topic, so to speak, there is an S topic, so we need this, uh, this uh, transparency, but it's not only about transparency, we also need to translate it into the language of business and the capital market. And therefore, this is the, the reasoning behind this value balancing alliance I was alluding to in a minute. So, so the, we, we need not only to operationalize and to quantify, but also to monetize all these kinds of sustainability topics. That's not easy for sure for human rights, but we need to do that at the end of the day. And then we bring it into the accounting systems and then we bring it into the financial and capital market uh, evaluation of a company. And so that, that is really needed that the prices are more or less telling the truth. And then this interconnection is drawn and is seen and it's integrated in the business realm, so to speak. And that is, that is what we are currently doing. And all, not only we, that is what, where, where I see the uh, ways going forward. And, and by definition, this does not only need to be holistically, this needs to be globally. Thank you so much. Uh, and the whole pricing about the impact, of course, is very interesting because <laughs> some is easier to price, but some others are much more difficult to price, actually, right? What you price put you on uh, human life, what price you put on certain other issues. Paul, I'm coming to you. Coca-Cola, of course, never, no one probably would think immediately on climate change. Is that anyway a topic you are making the connection between human rights and climate change at Coca-Cola? Yeah, and I, and I appreciate the, I think this is a, a fascinating discussion and another part of another one of these um, next 10 year areas of focus that we're all going to be dealing with on the human rights side. <clears throat> I'd say, you know, at Coke, what we've learned is this is one, this is a classic example of why it's important to integrate human rights throughout the function and decision making um, of a company. And I, tell you, I use, for example, a world without waste program, um, which is focused on our plastic recycling. And, you know, we have a number of, of uh, targets that we have within that program when it comes to recycling. We're going to collect and recycle a bottle or can for every one we sell by 2030, make 100% of our packaging recyclable by 2025, and then use at least 50% recycled materials and packaging by 2030. So those, those are all being driven uh, by an initiative that is you know, certainly run by the folks within our sustainability group. The important part is that we got in as a human rights function to work with them on that as well. 
and consider some of the social human impacts of this program. And it's something that you would not frankly naturally consider when you're focused on that type of initiative. But what you don't think about unless you bring in that human rights element, and that was what he's talking about connected the E to the S, is who is collecting this plastic and how's it being collected? And while a number of us live in countries that have very formal collections sectors and programs, in many countries, it's an informal sector where there are people simply that are picking it um, in various places around the country as not, and not part of a formal process. They're not formally employed by anybody. They collect it and bring it to collection centers. And so that's a very vulnerable worker population. And as we increase this collection effort, there's gonna be an increased number of people involved in that process. And the question is, what is it that we need to be doing from a human rights perspective to ensure that those individuals are being treated properly, have safe workplaces, are being paid appropriately. Um, and that's what we're doing through a partner initiative, working with our World Without Waste program to bring a whole due diligence framework. We call it our SGP, Supplier Guiding Principles, basically taking our supplier audit protocol and then taking it down to the informal waste collection sector. Um, and doing that in partnership with a number of NGOs and other companies to drive broad impact. Um, and so at the same time that we're focused on this um, environmental issue, we're having a positive impact on the people that are involved in the collection process. And that is, that is the type of partnership from a social, environmental, or human rights sustainability um, factor that we need and that we're focused on having more of within the company. Thank you, Paul. That's great. And Gila, you will have the last word on the panel. <laughs> and indeed, I want to refer to one question from Linda Komyong, who asked about, you know, there are a lot of front runner companies also here on the panel, but how do we make sure you bring the broad SME community on board on this agenda? So to be honest, I thought you have less than 6,500 uh, employees. 6,500 is quite a lot already, but perhaps you can elaborate, you know, also in your last word when you speak about climate change also, how do we do or how do we ensure that we bring more SMEs on board? Over to you, Gisela, for the last word. Okay. Of the panel, of the day. I'm actually. not sure if I can answer this <laughs> question, but uh, just I think we have to connect human rights and we have to connect it together with the environmental issues. But we have to look back because when we see Cerezo is more than 15 years ago. And since then, we've got a lot of initiatives. We've got management systems for environmental issues. And this is something companies are familiar with. The WAGA principles from 2011, yeah, they, the, the background was because somebody, John WAGA, worked out who is responsible for human rights because there was a lack. Human rights had not no attention in the business world. And this is something we have to focus on environmental issues. Yes, we do this in a company we are responsible for. We see the efficiency right now uh, when we take a look at the Ukraine conflict. But the human rights, the responsibility is at the government stage. And this is something we have to bring together. Yeah. And this is from my perspective, a problem we have not discussed deeply enough. Great, thank you so much for that. I would like to thank the panel. I would like to ask for applause for the panel and I would directly give over <laughs> to Nicole. Thank you very much to all the panelists and to Matthias for your views from the business side. And this brings us indeed to the end of our conference. Um, we would like now to welcome back Gabriela from the IOE and Renate from the BDA as the two hosts to close the conference with a few final words from your side, and that will guide us through into the weekend. So we need to get Renate and Gabriela also here to see them on screen. Um, but maybe since we have the virtual format if you're already online. Um, Absolutely. How's my sound? Your sound is perfect. Yes. So Very good. please is, start talking. Very good. This is Gabriella again. And just what an honor. Thank you so much for having included us. Um, and I just want to congratulate all of the organizers and all of the presenters this week. Um, when I think and reflect on um, some observations, 
I think in terms of the what, well, we have the what. It is the global framework that we already have in place. It's the UN guiding principles and its 10-year roadmap that are really, as we heard from Michelle Bachelet, it is the recognized global standard and we have more work to do. Progress, she said, was being made, but more work to do in terms of its meaningful implementation. And why? Because human rights matter and business uh, you've heard um, and you've seen it's committed to meeting its responsibility to respect human rights. But also we expect, fully expect that states and other stakeholders are going to do the same within their respective duties and responsibilities as well. And where does that need to happen? National levels. We heard that from High Commissioner Bachelet. She said it's a lot easier to speak in the abstract than to deal with challenges on the ground. And we heard a lot about the importance of engaging with SMEs from the audience here, Linda Cromyong from um, Amphori raised SMEs as well and supporting their capacity. Uh, we heard about challenges in governance gaps like informality um, and the scale of that challenge, which needs serious addressing. How are we going to do that? Well, you heard it from the companies. They're doing internal work, policies, governance, training, expectations, auditing, all the best practices you've heard this week. And But we're going to be working to raise the bar. This is what Thomas from Deutsche Post DHL said, raise the bar and find better ways to communicate, um, uh, measure and communicate the positive impacts of business. Paul talked about how they're doing that at Coca-Cola, but we also heard that from Angela from the WTO, the need to better communicate the benefits of trade and speaking honestly about the challenges in, in getting there, um, but also the opportunities. Um, and then uh, very importantly, uh, we heard about the need for support to national governments uh, to be able to better effectively enforce their own national laws and, and, um, and uh, rule of law domestically. Foreign assistance, other measures. I agree with the last speaker who said we didn't talk enough about that. Uh, ways to support the, this um, uh, key role at national levels. So I leave this com uh, conference realistic um, about the work ahead, but nevertheless optimistic. And the UNGPs and its 10 year roadmap our key and count on us at USCIB and all of the business organizations involved today to be there with uh, all of us um, in that journey ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And I will just um, continue from um, what you last said, Gabriela, um, to say I think this was a very timely conference because as you could see, we have a lot of regulation and a lot of discussion, regulatory discussion at uh, global international level, but also at regional level. And I think it is so important to bring into this discussion also the voice of business, of the practical implementation or the problems uh, or the challenges for practical implementation. So I think we have been very successful in this conference to bring together both policymakers and the practitioners uh, to have an informed debate and improve the de debate. And what I'm particularly proud about is that we really had a global uh, participation from all parts of the world. Um, and I would like to thank very, very much uh, Deutsche Post, our host, Deutsche Post DHL, um, Nicole um, for really uh, being the master of ceremonies and for hosting this. Uh, it was really very, very good. And I think this hybrid format has um, really shown its advantages because it um, accumulates the um, nice aspect of having people together in person with the possibility for those who come from far away to participate without having to travel a very, very long distance and being able to combine it with other obligations. So thank you very, very much, Nicole. Also, thank you so much, Jürgen, Rebecca and Bianca. And of course, um, also um, those colleagues who participated as speakers, um, Thomas Ogilvy, the corporate board member for human resources at Deutsche Post DHL Group, and Lilian Ung, who is the uh, executive vice president employee relations at the last, um, this very last panel, which uh, just finished.
it was very, very interesting and really nice to, to have this conference. Um, let me also thank my colleague, Paul Noll, um, who was absolutely active and instrumental in organizing and in preparing this conference. Um, and my last thanks, uh, last but not least, go to the IOE, to Monique de Pierre, to Jason Pega Toge, and uh, to Matthias Torns for um, also having organized, co organized this. And Gabriela, thanks to you for this uh, concluding word. Um, as um, our uh, chair of the um, RBC working group in business in, in um, IUE. So thank you very much, Gabriela, for joining us. And uh, so with this, I really would like to thank everybody. I hope you have a good time in Bonn and I hope all the others will be motivated to come to Bonn at, at the next occasion and see you all at the next discussion because I'm sure this will not have been the last discussion between business and policymakers. So thank you very, very much. And I suppose I'm now to close this conference and to close this event, unless I hand over to um, Nicole again. But um, it was a great event. Thank you to everybody for participating in a very active way. And have a good weekend and see you indeed at the next occasion, probably in the ILO global supply chain discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriela, and also Renate for the closing words. And with that, we are closing the conference for today. Thank you very much for coming here and for joining online, spending the time with us, discussing, thinking, taking some thoughts with you and working on that. And we are all very much looking forward to seeing you hopefully next year. So with that, goodbye and have a great weekend. Thank you.